Hi and welcome to this session about building devices that can run for years on small batteries. My name is Ivan Holt. I am a software engineer and I work in the field of healthcare systems. For the last few years I have been building different types of IoT prototypes at my local makerspace. I have published a few guides over at Element 14 and Hackster and today we will look at one of these projects. You can find more details about the project over at Element 14. Search my, for my name Ivan Holt and you will find a quite comprehensive write-up. You can also find the source code for the project at GitHub the username is I've halt. Uh, this session will go through a demo and an overview of the project. I will have a quick run through of the service stack and how messaging works before we have a look at the device hardware. Then I will uh, run through some battery options and considerations before we look at some measurement techniques. Then we will run through some of the code for the device before I end with some lessons that I have learned during this project. The project came alive because our mailbox is positioned a bit uh, ways from our house. And uh, these days we don't receive spam mail much of uh, communication is digital, so we might receive letters a few times uh, a week. Having to walk back to the street and to check the mailbox is the reason that I started this project. It was started about two years ago and it has been running on the same AAA batteries since then. The uh, requirements for the project was that I wanted a notification on my phone when a uh, mail was received. The mailbox itself is out of Wi-Fi range, so I needed more uh, range. I didn't want to have to change batteries often, and I wanted some kind of safeguard in case the device died or something got disconnected. If I heard, hadn't heard from it for a few days, I wanted to have a notification. For a project like this, the choice of sensor is crucial and you will probably have to make some type of compromise and you have to decide what is more important. I chose reliability in this project and of course battery life. I did consider quite a few different physical phenomena to measure to send the notifications and I discovered that infrared would not make for a long uh, battery life. Also it would be hard to sense whole space of the mailbox. Most of the same um, things went for the ultrasonic uh, sensor and I also realized that I probably would have to have several uh, ultrasonic sensors to be able to cover the whole space. Small partial pickup notes were hard to detect. They are really thin, light and small and they tend to stick to the sides of the box. That leads me to the next choice. I tried to make a kind of weight measurement, but I quickly uh, discovered that this was really hard to make reliable and um, it would not sense the small pickup notes. And I assumed that it would probably get uh, misaligned or stuck over time. Camera would have been really nice, so you could actually see what was inside the box, but um, this would not work well with a low energy solution, and it would also not work well with uh, low energy networks because of the data size to transmit. I was left with either using a read switch or tilt switch, as some call it, or a micro switch. The read switch seemed like a good option. I could put it in the lid 
and it would trigger when the lid was tilted. But being able to mount it in the correct position turned out to be a bit of a problem. And I decided to test out a micro switch. It is a very simple solution. Some think it is too simple, but uh, it was easy to mount. It is reliable. It has been working for a few years and uh, I'm happy with, uh, with this solution. I had decided not to mount the electronics on the inside of the mailbox as not to compromise the space. I used a outdoors electrical junction box to protect the electronics from the weather. It worked really well, but after placing it outdoors for the first time, I became a bit nervous of what would uh, be waiting for me when I came home. Especially after listening to Ben Ward out of the Oxford Flood Network describe his experiences with placing anonymous looking uh, boxes with wires sticking out of them in public or semi-public places. So I went to my local makerspace and uh, borrowed a vinyl cutter and made some semi-professional looking decals. I have mo uh, modeled and 3D printed a custom enclosure and the next steps will be to make resin casting out of this. Next we will have a very brief look at the service stack. I have defined a pretty standard the Things Network application and this will route messages to a platform called All Things Talk. The Things Network application in this project receives messages from the device containing the battery voltage. The battery voltage has been split into two bytes and I have had to define a decoder that puts these two bytes together as an integer. The integration makes sure that the messages get passed along to All Things Talk. And in All Things Talk, I can define rules. One rule will make sure that notifications are sent to my mobile phone and email whenever the lid is opened. Another rule will uh, give the same type of notification if nothing has happened for the past four days. Next we will look at some very important hardware considerations. To be able to achieve long battery life the device will have to be in deep sleep mode for as much as possible. Therefore, I had to choose a LoRaWAN development board that had the lowest possible current consumption during deep sleep. Also, it would have to have the capability of defining the type of interrupt that would wake it from deep sleep when needed. Finally, a current consumption during transmission would have to be at the lowest possible uh, level. I have tried a few different development boards. These are my recommendations. Uh, Rocket Scream makes a few different types and some of you may recognize the low power library uh, which is written by the uh, maker of these boards. Clara Core has a bit of a more modern approach. This board is also much smaller. I chose a board from Weissen, uh, which at the time, a few years ago, uh, seemed like the best uh, solution. Uh, the author also has uh, made quite a few good uh, tutorials regarding low power consumption and also the use of coin cells. The next part was crucial to get right. The development board spends most of its time in deep sleep mode conserving energy. Only a few pins are capable of being defined as interrupts to wake 
the development board from this mode. The uh, micro switch has two configurations and I used uh, the one called normally closed. This means that normally the microcontroller will be sleeping and the lid will be closed. This leads to the micro switch being depressed and the switch circuit will be open, that is not completed. When the lid is opened, the switch is released and this will complete the circuit. And this will lead to a rising edge on the pin that is used. Following this, <clears throat> the pin will be in high state and still nothing is happening. The microcontroller is still in sleep mode. But when the mail is deposited and the lid is closed, the pin with the micro switch will enter falling edge and this triggers an interrupt. This leads to the microcontroller waking, measuring the battery, sending a radio signal, registering a new interrupt and going to sleep. The choice of a battery is very important for a project like this. LiPo batteries have become quite popular in recent years. They have a very high energy density. They often come with convenient connectors that fit many modern development boards and they have a predictable flat voltage curve and they are rechargeable. These types of batteries are suited for projects with high uh, current demand like driving motors and such. But because of a high self-discharge uh, rate, maybe as high as 5% a month, does not make it suitable for a low energy sensor. Because of restrictions on uh, transportation with the planes, they are quite expensive and as I have experienced myself, they are quite dangerous. High quality alkaline batteries are a good option as they have a low self discharge rate and because of availability, the price is quite low. You will, however, need an efficient regulator to make the highest use of them. The LS14500 types of batteries are another interesting option. Compared to alkaline batteries of the same size, they have quite a high energy density and the nominal voltage of 3.6 volts and a flat voltage curve makes them an interesting choice for 3 volt circuits. They have a low self-discharge rate, which is also useful. They are, however, a bit expensive. Lithium coin cell batteries are very cheap and they can last for a long time. Using them for IoT projects can be a bit of a challenge as continuous discharge will damage them and you have to rely on pulse discharging. The most important part of this session is about measurement techniques. Without being able to measure, it's all guesswork. I started attempting to measure current consumption two years ago by using a rather expensive fluke multimeter and using the ammeter function and I was quickly disappointed realizing that uh, below a milliampere it was quite unreliable. Next I got hold of a more suitable multimeter but still it was not uh, suitable for even lower values and it was not until I got hold of a a micro current gold that I was able to consistently measure micro amperes. The problem though was that the program code of the microcontroller moves between different phases from sleeping to waking up, taking measurements, starting up components, transmitting messages and so on 
and being able to display these using a uh, multimeter is quite difficult and you end up having to put in a lot of delays or similar techniques. Next I wanted to try to use an oscilloscope to display the current consumption on a timeline. So I used a non-switching lab power supply, I used the microcurrent and I used the oscilloscope's serial decode feature so that I could display debug strings on the timeline. This might have worked. Dave Jones has stated that the microcurrent is not suitable for oscilloscopes and I soon discovered why. Uh, firstly, it was picking up a lot of noise and it was very hard to see what was um, the actual value and what was just noise. And um, we, I tried to bypass the development board's switching regulator and that helped a lot, but still there was a lot of noise. Uh, the other practical problem was that the way the my oscilloscope displays serial decode on the timeline, you are uh, limited to how far you can zoom out on the timeline and it was just not practical. I have uh, received a tip that maybe I could have used one of the GPIOs to trigger the oscilloscope instead but it is still not a perfect solution and it is a lot of uh, setup. So when you switch back and forth from improving the code to measuring and back and forth it is a lot of hassle. Luckily, a company called Koitech had just released a device called the OT Arc. I still believe that an oscilloscope and a reliable lab power supply and a good multimeter are essential tools for working with this kind of thing. I think a demonstration will speak for itself how convenient this device is. The OT Arc will act as a power supply and I have replaced the battery connectors on the development board with the battery terminals with the power terminals on the OT Arc. We will start with the same voltage as the batteries combined and I have also connected a serial output from the device. And before we start the um, device, I will just clear uh, the TTN console so we can see the transmission. We start a new recording and we enable the power supply. And the, the upper part of the screen is the uh, current consumption. The middle part is uh, the voltage that will become quite useful uh, later. And in the bottom part we can see the serial output. And these are my uh, debug statements in my code. So I will just trigger the device. And it will uh, send a message and go back to sleep. And um, I will pause uh, or stop the recording now. And switch off the power supply. We can go to check the console and uh, we find that the device joined and it sent two messages. Now we can return and we can have a, a look at what uh, went on here. Firstly, my code has a little delay uh, when it starts to make a debugging convenient. 
uh, we can uh, select one of the debug statements and it will highlight in the timeline where we are and this is extremely valuable and uh, makes for a re really efficient workflow when investigating uh, the code and making optimizations and verifying the results. We can also um, select several uh, debug statements. So I will uh, I'll just uh, uh, firstly describe what is going on here. Uh, the device uh, runs its setup and it makes one transmission and <coughs> this transmission uh, also makes sure that we join the uh, network so that would account for these two first uh, um, statements in the TTN uh, log Our uh, voltage is uh, measured and uh, displayed and uh, we can see that the radio has joined the network, the transmission completes. Then the device goes into something I've called Grace Sleep and this is an intermediary phase before it completely powers down and uh, this is something I implemented because just in case someone would open and close the, the lid of the mailbox uh, several times or there was some kind of vibration or something like that so in the grace period that would account for for this period the uh, device is sleeping for eight seconds so we can see what kind of current consumption is going on in this period. That is about 13 micro amperes, which is pretty good. And in this phase, the device is not responsive at all. So opening and closing the lid will not wake the device. When this um, grace sleep period ends the device enters proper power down or deep sleep this is where we achieve the lo lowest uh, current consumption and uh, this is about eight or nine uh, microamps that is pretty good Now the device will sleep until the uh, micro switch is activated or it hits a falling edge. This is what I triggered in this part of the graph. We hit a, a statement that says power up. The uh, device will measure batteries and uh, send a message so we can see the different parts uh, here the entire sequence is this uh, this part we are seeing the the, the average and you can obviously see a uh, spike this part only happens maybe twice a day and uh, often uh, not every day uh, so this is uh, pretty good and uh, when the transmission is complete we again enter a gray sleep where the device is sleeping for eight seconds and in it, it is not listening for inter interrupts when that is complete it again powers down and uh, as much as possible and uh, we have a pretty low uh, current consumption 
So my basic workflow is to write some code, profile, and try to find problem areas, do code iterations, and do another profile, and uh, see if I fix the problem, and so on. Uh, and this is really uh, efficient way to work. There are so many things that you can do with uh, this uh, with the OT arc, and um, I will only show a few more things. The power regulator is very important when you're especially using alkaline batteries, as I am. Let's have a look at what happens if I simulate that the the batteries have uh, dropped in voltage meaning they are running out of juice we will start another recording and compare sometimes it's hard to uh, synchronize the graphs when you're uh, clicking but you can um, adjust the uh, start time uh, later so you can try to sync them up now the device has uh, joined and sent a message and it is sleeping and uh, I will see if I can trigger uh, transmission just about at the same time as last. Okay, it has um, transmitted and uh, it is entering power down or deep sleep. So I will disconnect the power source and stop the recording. We can evidently see that the power source or the, the voltage was uh, much lower in this uh, example. We can also see some evidence that uh, switching power regulator is uh, working much harder in this case. And uh, when we look at the current consumption, it is much uh, higher. We can uh, just select one area. Now it did complete the transmission and join a bit later uh, in this second uh, run so I will try to find an area where um, the graphs are already synced or else I would have to adjust them. And um, we can see the debug outputs from both of our uh, runs. At this point we are in deep sleep and in the, the first run I remember that we were about eight and a half microamps. In the case where the batteries have dropped in voltage the consumption is much higher. The regulator has to work much harder to supply. This is also very um, useful. I will demonstrate one more thing. I talked about using coin cell batteries. I'll use an uh, additional feature which is called the battery toolbox, uh, which can do a few things, uh, including emulating batteries. So I will uh, select one type of battery that has been defined. I will uh, not track uh, the used uh, capacity of the battery. I will just have a look at the voltage uh, drop. So we again we start a new recording. We activate the power supply. Now we will see drops in voltage. I have 
done this with a with an actual coin cell battery of this type it didn't look exactly the same the, it used a much more time to uh, regain um, the voltage but the important thing <coughs> to to notice here is that the device is just running and resetting and running and resetting it's, it can't complete its cycle because the voltage drops too low so I will stop this recording now we can um, basically have a look at where our problem uh, starts no surprise the voltage drops happen where our transmissions happen where we have a high spike to use coin cell batteries you have to do a kind of different approach where you might have to make some kind of a buffer with a capacitor or something like that your code also needs to try to respect pulsing so that uh, you, do, you don't make the, the device do its work as quickly as possible you might have to insert pauses to let the battery uh, regain its uh, voltage I usually program my uh, board using the FTDI interface and I would have liked to see a possibility to program the board through the OTARC or some other method so that I don't, wouldn't have to connect and disconnect uh, when switching between doing code iterations, programming the board and power optimizations. Maybe it's possible to do this, I don't know. My dad is a experienced ham radio operator and uh, he has shown me quite a few valuable tricks. I noticed that some of my LoRa antennas were performing differently and after some uh, reading on the uh, TTN forums I saw reports of dodgy antennas being sold with uh, LoRa devices and in some cases plain wrong uh, antennas uh, bundled for instance Wi-Fi antennas the proper way to measure if your antenna is appropriate would be to use a spectrum analyzer. These are quite expensive and you also need some extra equipment to be able to measure antennas properly. One budget solution is to buy one of the many popular vector network analyzers. I advise you to spend some time reading about them and um, there is apparently some drama going on uh, regarding open hardware design and um, missing royalties and, and whatnot. You should also make sure that you buy one that completely covers the frequency that is uh, in your area of the world. So in my case it is 868 megahertz. And um, I bought a vector network analyzer that goes up to 1 gigahertz. I have used this on my gateway antennas also and it is a cheap way to remove some uncertainty. In the TTN console you can see some characteristics about your radio transmissions. I wanted further ways to investigate this and maybe visualize it. That's uh, how I started uh, the path down into software-defined radio. After some experimentation I ended up with an AirSpy R2 and uh, a preamplifier that was suitable for the uh, frequency that we use in my part of the world. And uh, I used a, um, an antenna that is usually used for, for gateways. You will find some uh, insight into how LoRa transmissions uh, work and some um, attempts at reverse engineering. But um, you shouldn't expect to be able to read the encrypted payload in a LoRa 1 transmission. 
but there are some things that you can uh, have a look at and uh, with my setup I have been able to visualize and see my device transmissions you would be able to get a feeling of uh, the transmission strength or at least if it changes dramatically for instance by changing to a dodgy antenna you can measure the uh, the bandwidth this can uh, help you investigate maybe that ADR is not uh, working as you expect you can measure airtime which is really useful and this will be for the complete transmission you can uh, visualize if your device is listening for downlinks when that is not intentional now we will have a look at the code for the device i use arduino environment and some popular libraries if you want to look at further details you can always visit the project description at element 14 and you will find the source code at github to have a look at the highlights in our setup code, we defined the pin that the micro switch is connected to as an in input with a pull up resistor. And this cannot be any old pin, it has to be one that is interrupt enabled. And you'll have to look up the datasheet to find this. We disable non essentials. In this case, this is the flash memory that we don't uh, need to access. I've used the library to power this down. Further, we perform a LoRa1 initiation and we start joining the network by sending a message. The message consists of an array with two bytes. We have a function that retrieves the battery voltage and we split this value into two bytes. We have to redefine the transmission power if we want to override it every time the radio module uh, wakes up from sleep. And this is the part where we queue our transmission. We are not interested in receiving confirmation of a received message. Hopefully this will result in an event that is called uh, transmission complete. If we look at OTARC in the code, we have passed a setup, we have sent the transmission, we have read the voltage, we have joined, and now we hopefully have received a transmission complete event. So this completes the uh, joining and this uh, first sending. Next, I want to uh, define a grace period where I'm not interested in looking at uh, what the, the micro switch is doing. I just want it to conserve energy. And I perform a sleep on the radio module. And I use the low power library to power down the microcontroller for 8 seconds. You will see some places that when I uh, perform a print line on the serial, I follow with a serial flush. And this is because when I power down the MCU, this can sometimes cut the serial uh, communication short. So this flush just makes sure that uh, the serial uh, line has uh, completed. After eight seconds, we continue with a complete power down or a deep sleep. And in uh, our measurement, we are at this point. So this is eight seconds. The power down is uh, quite similar to the gray slip, except that we attach an interrupt to an interrupt capable pin 
and we defined a function that will be called uh, if this uh, interrupt triggers and we define that the mode is a falling edge. When we have defined this interrupt, we make the uh, MCU sleep forever. This is uh, this part of the code. And so the um, device will live in this state for most of its lifetime. So when the lid uh, triggers the switch, this method is called it does nothing and it shouldn't do a lot of uh, work. It can set some states or something that you can read later, but it shouldn't hold up uh, the uh, microcontroller because if you have several interrupts registered, if this is uh, running some uh, long running code, it will not notice the other interrupts. When the uh, interrupt is triggered, that me a method or function has been uh, called the MCU will continue down this code block. It has powered up and we want to clean up a few things. So we detach the interrupt and then we continue. We automatically time a new transmission the uh, radio will send this when it is available. When it is available, our do send method will be called again and the loop will continue. Finally, I will run through some lessons that I have learned while making this project. Firstly, the devil is in the details, meaning that if you want something to run for years on batteries, everything has to be deliberate and small mistakes can ruin the whole project. Source control everything. I usually make a private repository where I work on my project and when I want to share it, I make a new repository. For instance, at GitHub, I make sure not to share my private keys and such. I also usually keep 3D models and configuration files and documentation, uh, data sheets and, and stuff that you usually don't associate with source control. And this is useful even if you are a single developer. Uh, it is always uh, nice and it can be a lifesaver to be able to go back some versions. Build mockups of where your sensor is supposed to be placed. I built a simple replica of my mailbox using foam core and it saved me a lot of hassle. If you plan to design a custom enclosure, I advise you to model the electronic first. It doesn't have to be a detailed model, but something that will save you some trial and error so that you know the dimensions of the electronics. Then you can build your enclosure around this. Most boards come with some status LEDs and if you are planning to make a device that will live for years, you don't need these LEDs. In some cases you will have to desolder the whole LED. I wish that I had saved some reference batteries when I deployed this uh, sensor in the beginning. That way I could uh, compare what natural self-discharge has meant compared to uh, the device being powered and used. I started using some no-brand batteries and they died due to freezing temperatures the first night. So buy some proper quality batteries. Document your project. If that means writing something down in a book or writing a guide that you publish and share with others, it is really helpful to be able to go back and look at the decisions you made and why you made them. An oscilloscope with serial decode capability is really useful. More and more sensors are uh, digital and they communicate over a bus type or the other. And being able to read them raw without going through a microcontroller is really useful. 
Thank you for following this session. I hope there has been something useful for you and happy hacking. Wow, so this is the fireside chat. First, Olivier, Olivier Seller, um, VP, no, the, almost. the uh, technical fellow, yeah. almost technical fellow, wireless and IP. Uh, we're going to talk about what uh, he is doing later, but uh, take a seat. Thanks. Francois, voilà. you're the VP. You can also see by uh, the suit. Uh, <laughs> and um, you're, we're going to talk about what you're doing also. VP, IoT, IoT and Laura Product. And Laura Business. All right, so this is the commercial guy. And then last but not least, Nicola. A uh, friend of mine, also, but, uh, currently uh, <laughs> uh, CTO of uh, Semtech, so we're both uh, CTO, so we have a so you connection have a there. I'm, I'm, I need a chair as well, but uh, we'll... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, grab a seat, grab a seat. No, 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 grab a seat. That one is for you. So um, uh, the floor is open at the whole time for questions. Uh, so Chris is uh, walking around. If you have a question, just raise your hand. Uh, it's uh, Ask Us Anything session. Very special, we never had it at the Things Conference, and definitely not with uh, these uh, three heroes that we have here. So, um, le let's get started. How, uh, how do you guys know each other, actually? Olivier, to start with you, how, how, do you know, how do you know the guy sitting next to you? So, with Nico, we've been uh, schoolmates for <clears throat> 25? 25 years? 25 years, yeah. yeah? 25 years. Yeah, we, yeah, we, we met 25 years ago. So you were in school together? Yeah. yeah. And we, we, we were the army together. Army, school. Army? Then, yeah. yeah. Then mm -hmm. second school. Okay. So that's, yeah, been together at school for five or six years. Yeah. Okay. And uh, by this time, we were already geeks. Yeah. I, you're still, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> and we, already, we always wanted to later do something technical, yeah. setting up companies together, well, with other geeks around, yeah. and it, it eventually happened. And uh, Francois, we, the three of us met uh, in Sophie Antipolis, close to Nice. Close to Nice, yes. 16, yeah, 16 years back. 16 years ago. Mm. So it's a little bit more recent, but a long way. <laughs> Still a long and, way. And were you already working on something related to Laura at the time that you came along, or did you know each other before that already? We knew each other before. Ah. So Laura came in a few years after we actually met. Mm. Okay. And, and what, what are your backgrounds? What, what, uh, Nicola, what, what did you do in your studies? What did you study? Uh, quite classically, I think I studied electrical engineering at school. Electrical engineering, yeah. yeah exactly. So, uh, yeah, I wanted to be a computer scientist, and then I discovered that hardware is sexy. So, so I went and did uh, analog design. Okay. And worked for a few uh, worked for a few companies there, and then you know, slowly made up the food chain. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And and you, Patra, what did you do in school? So um, I'm also engineering school at the beginning in RF as this guy, but this guy had a very high diploma in RF. I have a smaller diploma, but I am Italian, so it's compensate as well. So it's fine. <laughs> and uh, I started for ten years in technical stuff, but that I find that the marketing guy in the team was not good enough, so I moved to marketing. Yeah. And I find one of the tenures, and I find that um, the sales guy was not good enough. So I was moving to the sales team. And then it was time for me to go out. So I went out uh, uh, the job, and uh, I wanted to create a team. And I find this guy to say, want to create a team, and say, they wanted to create a team as well. So we have a beer, and, yeah. and we're here. That's how nice. it started. Yeah, yeah and... I, I heard rumors that uh, you were single at the time, huh? Eh? Yes, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. indeed. The uh, relocating to, to, to Nice and getting to work with Nicolas, which was part of the start of the story, is a side effect of uh, online dating. Because yeah. by this time I was single, as you say, and uh, I, I met my, my wife. We now have four kids. And... Uh, Pretty soon, uh, she was expecting, so I, I called Nicolas because I need to find a deep job <laughs> elsewhere. He called, he called me and said, I need a job today. <laughs> <laughs> so you are friends from school, 
uh, knowing each other for a long time, and you say, hey, Nicola, uh, my uh, wife is pregnant, and uh, I need a job. Yeah, and she was not my wife yet. But oh, yes. was, yeah, yeah, she yeah, was yeah. pregnant. Now she is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she still is, right? She still is. <laughs> Very good. Okay, cool. Um, so you guys say um, uh, you, are, you were in the army. Uh, I'm not sure if it's true, but is LoRa or Chirp Spread Spectrum, is that also a military technology originally, like in U-boats mm -hmm. underground? It's, uh, it's been used forever, effectively, in the military. So, yeah. like the first British raiders during the Second World War, they were already using Chirps. Uh, submarine communication are using Chirps. Uh, but radars, you know, sonars are using chirps. Bats are using chirps. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we've not invented chirps at all, and we don't claim that. Okay. <laughs> Do we have some early questions from the audience? Just uh, uh, we we get to many topics later, but uh, I'm sure Jan has a question very soon. Mm -hmm. um, I need also need a clicker. Does she have the clicker? Because we have a few photos to show later. Thank you. Um, so. Um, how did it how did it start it? So you were in uh, electrical engineering. You were also electrical engineering, or yeah, electrical or engineering, physics, digital or? communications. Yeah, physical That's communications. Um, how did you end up doing something in uh, wireless? Or oh, wireless was was really our day to day job. We were doing wireless chips. Yeah, uh, and then we we had an idea of a problem, not an idea of a solution. Especially Nicolas, uh, you wanted to just do zero G, maybe I would say. Yeah. Well, by this time in wireless, everybody was looking for higher data rate, shorter range, yeah. but nobody was taking care of the other way. Yeah. And you know, when when you're the first to look at something, and if you find something, well, you you're in good shape. And uh, we were lucky enough to be the first one to look in the other direction to the other side of the uh, data rate curve. Yeah. And, and, and w what were you thinking, Francois, when you were working with these young, crazy guys uh, in uh, RF and stuff? Do you, 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 were, you were seeing something, right? Yes. And also marketing-wise and commercially. Yes. In fact, okay, there is this great idea, and all the idea was to see what we can do with that. So we, we tried to have a look to many applications, and the first one was very funny, was the walkie-talkie. So I say, can we do a demo? So I don't know if you can show a picture about how it looked like the first demo, OK? Yeah, and I after have, that, you can show it, the yeah. demo. And uh, say, well, with this kind of stuff, I can go to uh, Nokia and to Apple. <laughs> easy, OK, easy. So I went there, I make a demo, and we show them. There is one guy here in the room, uh, Joe Knapp, was uh, with me there. And they like, people like very much the idea to do that, but they say, bring me a chip. Yeah. We have only a, a nice, big demo like that. <laughs> so I say, uh, it will be tough to do that. So perhaps we have to think something else. And then we move to nice stuff is water meter. Less fun, but at least we can do that yeah. much easily. So your job was also to, to do the commercial part, right? To uh, yes, to convert an idea yeah. in something that uh, has value for a customer. Yeah. At the end. Yeah. So good combination of you three. You, you, so I, you, I have you, had, you had to invent the application, basically. Yes, That's because at, at the end, people don't know what you can do with that. Okay? People thought that before, it was not IoT, it was M2M. And uh, they have 2G, they have 3G, they have 4G, so why something else? So when you knock the door, say, I don't need you. We don't need you. So we need to show, do you have any problem? And based on that, they find something. I, I see. Good. And when was the last time you soldered something? I sold something? Yeah. This morning, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. So, uh, Very good. So, uh, good. Um, I want to go to the first, I think it's one of the first prototypes. Uh, Nicola, uh, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about what we see here. Oh, yeah. Well, the, that's starting to age, right? So as the sticker says on the picture, this was a prototype built for iTron. Uh, it's one of the, actually it was a 2.4 gigahertz LoRa. So actually, LoRa was born at 2.4 gigahertz. So it's funny that we're coming back full circle, yeah. back to it yeah, today. We, we get to that, yeah. Right? And um, this was a, a, a prototype assembled in a hurry. Um, worked pretty well, though. And it, it, it got us our first contract, actually. 
with Vitron. We went and tested it against um, their you know, state-of-the-art 433 megahertz solution, and we won the battle. Ah, good. So, and and when, when was this? That's uh, 2000, 2010. 2010. It's already yeah, 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you said it's an FPGA board. We just programmed it like uh, during you know, overnight. Uh, we're connecting it to a computer uh, and just using that as a, mm. as a demo. But it always broke, like it always failed. The, the, the thing would detach, it would power down. And what you have to explain is these kind of things could work easily on a tiny coin cell. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> you have to imagine a little bit the face of a customer at that time. But, uh, because, of course, it was not at the cheap level before. It was just only on the board. Software, this is a software different radio platform. <laughs> but yeah. they were much harder to use and earn all by this time than now. Yeah. I mean, now we would use something much easier. Much smaller. Yeah. Nice. That's very cool. So we get back to the fireplace. So actually, uh, you know, talking about fire, one of those took fire on board a plane. It was going for a demo in London or UK somewhere. And we had one of those in the, in the yeah, package compartment and took fire. <laughs> one of, so at this time, you know, yeah. there wasn't all this drama about fire on board plane. It yeah. was usual. But uh, nonetheless, it, quite just, frightening. It, just because we screw it and the screw touch the battery yeah. and a short circuit and breathe some smoke. So. <laughs> Uh, we also had that once. Uh, yeah, I, I think like I shouldn't tell it here on, with the recording on. <laughs> but um, very then, so the, the first initial LoRa uh, chips that you did was uh, not as we know LoRa today, right? We know LoRa, LoRa when with uh, Star of Stars network, where you have a device and a gateway, and a gateway is a completely different device than a mm -hmm. than the than the node. Correct. But it started off with. Uh, Point, point to point, point right? to point, yeah. point to point, yeah. That's because that's that's what LoRa is was really good at initially. Yeah. But uh, being able to do simply point to point means the gateway is going to be simple too. But uh, as we said, we, we started trying to do uh, talky walkie applications, which <laughs> which was kind of a failure. <laughs> it's it's a total failure. It never worked. <laughs> and then so we were, some people got it to work today, but at that time, you know, you, we yeah. never pulled it out. Okay. And then, and then we, we turned into a metering, but by this time it was also point to point because it was a walk by metering. Yeah. Uh, so many uh, experiments with the uh, metering guys, uh, proving them that what we claimed was actually true. They, nobody believed us yeah. in the beginning. So I, I have another nice picture of, uh, I think, one of your first uh, ways to prove that it actually worked. Um, and that's here. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Nic Nicola, again, uh, I got this picture from you. Is it, is it your daughter? Yeah, yeah. yeah. C can you tell uh, uh, what, what we see here? So actually, there's, this is one of our, like, this is our range test uh, setup at that time. So we were on top of a mountain around Grenoble. The other side of the link was in a plane, flying away. Uh, so you see the prototype on the table. You see the antenna just, you know, screwed on, on the table. Uh, my little girl was just playing by because, you know, that would last an entire afternoon. So I had to carry her, you know, to, to bring her with us. Uh, we had also like food, coffee, everything. And this is Francois here. Uh, we're doing that together. Yeah. yeah. And we, we reached with um, 2.4, 80 kilometers. Yeah. So it was um, not so bad yeah. to show that the range were there. Very good. And this is also still point-to-point -point range testing, right? Hey, yeah. Yes, that was totally point-to-point. Yeah. -point. So one yeah. prototype on each side, purely point-to-point. -point. We're just doing ping-pong between the two, both, and, both and ends. The, and the 80 kilometers uh, was not the maximum? No. But the thing is, when you're 80 kilometers away and you still have 10 dB range, 10 dB more range, it means... Uh, oh, 800. 10x? Yeah. Oh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the plane would have run out of fuel before, yeah. Yeah. before we get out yeah. of range. So yeah. the plane came back at 80 kilometers. So the, the, the limit of the range was the fuel in the, in the plane, not... Yeah. <laughs> and so at this point, you were still... Um, uh, you, were, you, you weren't part of Semtech, right? The, no, so no, you, you were, it Semtech. was before this, yeah. so yeah. you had your company, Ciclio. Yeah. Uh, and you were with the three of you? Or was there... No, there is another guy who had we come on board after. It was uh, François Aidé. Yeah. We put him uh, as a CEO of... Um, Cicleo. Uh, first of all, because we don't want to be a CEO, whatever. We like what we do. Yeah. So, and it's better to hire a CEO, much better. So we have that, and then um, we work to make them to win some business and to better understand the market. We spent the first year to visit more than 100 customers 
just to understand exactly what was the need which on the market. Yo, um, we have a question from yeah, the audience. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, uh, Chris. Please, right. Hi, I'm Paul. Um, I was wondering, seeing all these experiments and from, from high up mountaintops, um, at what point did it really become a company, what you did? Was it quite early in, in uh, the experiments? Or did you all start uh, part-time next to another paying job to really finance the experimenting? Uh, how did that Great go? question. You want to answer or do I answer? Well, uh, go, go. All right, so uh, thank you, Paul, for the question. Um, it all started really as a, like a garage experiment. So both uh, Francois, Olivier, and myself had, had, had another job. Uh, when, it, you know, it, when we got the first result, the first one to quit his job was actually Francois. Mm -hmm. So Francois went, actually quit his job and really actually he was the one who set up the company and started visiting customers. So for that, we needed somebody who didn't have you know, another job because you cannot do that at night. We could no. work at night, he couldn't, right? The customer not. <laughs> <laughs> and so then, and then I left in like 2010, something like this, and I think Olivier was the latest one to join yeah. the, the, the company. So for a couple of years, I had uh, basically two jobs and doing, a, well, like you. And but, kids uh, growing up. Well, they were two and three years old. Something oh, like yeah. Yeah. Two yeah. and four years old, yeah. but uh, yeah, I, I was doing late night swim. I mean, yeah, as it's like yeah. every startup -er, Yeah, that's common practice. Yeah, sure. I guess that answers the question. Well, we have another question or remark from the audience. Please rise. So they can see you. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, Felix, thank you. Um, just connecting to the other question, how many times did you think about giving up? Uh, <laughs> uh, for my, never. never. Myself, then I cannot speak for the other one, but I never had any doubt. <laughs> yeah, never. Now, in fact, because we are three of us, I think when you create a company, it's very important to be, uh, we are still together since 16 years working on it, okay? So, and when one is a bit tight, could happen, okay? The other one gives you the energy. So, you, you never feel tight. Never, never, never. Okay? So Francois never feels tired. We do, <laughs> but he kind of moves with us. <laughs> because Francois, when someone says no to him, <laughs> it means maybe. Exactly. Uh, uh, so, it's actually a Laura Trinity, right? <laughs> <laughs> nice. So at this point, um, I, I think we are at, at the stage where uh, you get acquired by Semtech, right? Um, what was one of what was what what changed? What what changed for you as a team working together? I'll... I can say what changed for Nicola. Yeah, you know, you sell a company, it was a good sale, and uh, the first thing that Nicola bought was a bicycle. <laughs> and then he spent a nice weekend taking the train, 200 kilometers, and to make a tour of lake, something like that, with family, and come back. This is done. <laughs> so it was crazy. But I'll let you answer, and then I will answer after that. So really what changed is, you know, like, we were, like, technically speaking, uh, we were, like, nearly alone with Olivier. We had an, you know, external consultant working a little bit had, with us. We had Joe. Extremely yeah. limited technical resource, and, like, Joe here, making all the PCBs and prototype and, and uh, Francois was a bit alone on the sales side. So what getting into Semtech instantly gave us like a lot more resources, access to, you know, uh, RF designers, analog designers, digital. So suddenly we could do something professional, right? Uh, and make it into a real product. Yeah, so, so we were instantly integrated in a bigger team. The integration went completely seamlessly and we had much more, yeah, much more resources, yeah. and and we could, uh, we were able to have a product, our first product, a six twelve seventy two, yeah, within within a year, a year, less yeah. than a year, it took a year after the acquisition, we had our first working product. So that's uh, so you're, that, this is what changed. It yeah. became real. Yeah. So you became way more effective, yeah, uh, as part of Semtech. I want to say a small bracket because I saw Joe here. Joe was our, our first employee. For a French company to have a first employee, an American guy, you say, why? You know, when, uh, because we don't have any love money or whatever. So we work without salary or whatever. So we needed to buy uh, an employee who is willing, don't lose, don't win too much money. And Joe was okay to say one hour to work per week to be paid for that. So this is how we started. Yeah. And of course, when we joined Samtech, then he joined as well. And we have much more uh, things to do. What changed as well, I think, is we have to thank uh, it's not because we are employees of Semtech. 
But frankly speaking, the acquisition for us was not only a, a cash event or whatever, it was a quality of life and, and be sure that the product will be developed continuously. And Semtech invests a lot in order to give us the, the means to develop it, okay? And to believe in it for a few years. And this is not so easy. Yeah. Yeah. So the first two years, it was really heavy, heavy investment before what you can see result, and then we can speak about Laura yeah. and Jens and so on. Yeah. Yeah. So we were relaxed after the acquisition, though we had even more ambitions. Yeah. So. And um, so, so Nicola, for example, you, you the Semtech office eh, in uh, Grenoble, uh, f when I go there uh, uh, once a year or so, uh, it, it takes me a day to get there. Uh, are, are you, uh, is the whole Semtech office there because you were there? Is it, oh, yeah? No, we are in Grenoble because Francois was in Grenoble. Mm. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and the second aspect is uh, uh, with my wife, we, are, we still have a deal that, you know, um, every time we need to move the family, once she, she, she selects a new destination, and I select. So the time before I had selected, then it was our time to select. And she elected Grenoble because she has a nice PhD there, yeah. so she could, she could work there. So you there. told Semtech, my wife? decides that the Semtech office is going to be here. Uh, that, 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 that is what, uh, that's what you mean with quality of life as part of the acquisition, Very right? much it, yes. Very, good. very much. Oh. And actually, Olivier did even better. Yes, because I live, uh, I am west coast of France, uh, home office based, uh, like a bit far away from Grenoble, a bit far away from Switzerland, a bit far away from, yeah. from almost everything. But, but you are a fellow, so nobody cares. But, 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 <laughs> but that's the way I, I like to work. I like to work hard, by myself, by itself, yeah. For for yeah. hours and hours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I and can I talk to people, but and and one of I think one of the the most important things uh, uh, during these years happened is that uh, what I understand is that you guys started working on a gateway, the concentrator, uh, and also on the protocol, right, Laura Mac. The so how, can you tell us a little bit of, about the the idea and uh, why you thought that point-to-point -point didn't suffice, and you were thinking, okay, we need to move towards Star of Stars okay. and what became Laura Wen today. This maybe I can answer. So yeah, the, sure. um, uh, this came really early on in, in the state, so that um, when you want to build Internet of Things, the, uh, the approach that, you know, A22.1504 or Zigbee or, or took, what, you had the same chip on both ends of the link, right? And uh, obviously, that creates a whole lot of problems. You don't have capacity, it's not robust, you need a single channel network, you don't have frequency diversity, all of this was obvious. So very early on in the process, we realized that one day we would need something specific on the gateway, and that the gateway would need to be multiple channel, multiple data rates, so something much more carrier grade or like cellular than just Zigbee, right? Yeah, and, 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 and we needed an efficient protocol. Exactly. The tailored for the Internet of Things. Mm. So something with a redundancy between gateways, no handover, uh, super small uh, overhead for the protocol. Yeah. That's, that's really special. You had to, to do that. Uh, yeah, so that, okay, there I have to thank Joe. Um, this Laura one, or it was Laura Mac at the time, was born in one afternoon in a Swiss chalet. Uh, we were basically having like a corporate meeting. We were so bored that we were outside on the terrace. And we laid out on a piece of paper with Joe the foundation of Lohamac like in a couple of hours. So it was really one of those Ereka moments where you think about it afterwards, yeah. like that was a really useful afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> and then linked to that, what's happened is when you have this kind of um, interoperability, what you think about it, the next step was how to increase uh, the go-to market. Yeah. So, um, you know, we are French, so we like uh, to drink and to eat. And many, of, many things happened there. So we, I was in Paris with uh, Bouygues Telecom and uh, KPM, Franck Moine and Jaco. And so thinking about what we can do. So I proposed the L'Oréalien stuff to say, why not to have people around and to try to create something which push and do marketing. The idea at the beginning was mainly to do marketing. I didn't have this idea to, you know, to develop standardization based on that, which was marketing. And I should say as well that uh, this was accepted in size Semtech and Stalo Peterson take the lead and implement 100% the, uh, the LoRa Alliance. This is why we are here. And we were surprised because we put a date, 8 September, and 11 companies from worldwide, Indonesia, US, because there is IBM, Cisco, and jump on board in Geneva Airport 
to create this law alliance. So. And now, now it sounds like it's actually very international, the law alliance, but don't you think it's very French? The whole, it's, it's not a very French I, in crowd? I, non, non, je ne crois pas. No, non, <laughs> non, 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 Like, the proof is we don't speak French anymore at the TC meetings. The Laura Alliance. Yeah, okay. Um, so, um, um, that, I think, so around 2015, the uh, Alliance started uh, with the um, Laura Alliance, and um, <coughs> that's also when we started, the Things Network. Yes. Uh, Nic uh, Nicola, what, what was your first thought when you saw the Things Network popping up? Uh, uh, I, can't, I don't remember exactly the first time I heard about Things Network, but I, I immediately find the idea absolutely awesome. So I'm, I'm a really big believer that you should, you know, uh, empower people. Uh, so, so I like this, you know, everything that's linked to decentralized, democratic, uh, really appeals to me. And uh, so I immediately found the concept of TTN uh, um, extremely interesting. So I remember reaching out to you guys when you were just like both of you, right? Or it was like maybe Thomas Stillkamp, yeah. you and, and Vinke at that yeah. time, like an extremely small team. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I had to actually visit you on my early days. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because I wasn't allowed to do it on my business time. Yeah. Actually, as one uh, anecdote, when we were we were organizing uh, the Things Network meetups in the in the very beginning in the early days, and it was in the summer 2015, uh, and um, uh, we were uh, doing a presentation with uh, the Amsterdam uh, community because there was not more than TTN uh, Amsterdam. Uh, but uh, there was uh, there was a laptop on the table, uh, and there was somebody on Skype uh, dialing in. Uh, and it was Nicolas, and I, I didn't know Nicolas at the time, but I thought, okay, yeah, that's a, a guy uh, who wants to, from France, who also wants to join the presentation. And, uh, but we were not allowed to mention his name, uh, because, <laughs> because you were not, not allowed officially to be engaged with us. I think also at the time, the Things Network was quite uh, th threatening the uh, operator model, uh, yeah. and it was also in a period where uh, national operators were um, announcing their commercial deployment. So oh, I, it yeah. was for Semtech yeah. also, I think, a little yeah. bit challenging it, how to deal with us. It, it was very tough, you know, deciding how to communicate and how to behave. Uh, and uh, effectively, Semtech had a big loyalty to, you know, the operator customer, which was the one actually paying our salaries yeah. uh, at that time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And they still are, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> very good. Um, so, so I, I want to move a, a little bit towards the, the, the now. If, if there are any questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand. Chris is walking around with the microphone. Uh, this is your unique chance to ask any question. Um, so, this is a, so we covered the past. Um, I want to talk about now. And, and let's start with Olivier. What do you think Nicola does during a working day? <laughs> <laughs> so I think Nicola is the... Uh walking everywhere in the office, stalking to, any, to everyone. He's curious every line of code the guys are doing. And, uh, and this is the way he gets all these bright ideas, connecting things together, connecting people together. I think that's what he does every day. It's, is it, is it uh, it's a, it's pre Actually, it's pretty good. I don't do any work myself. He's right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did not attend that. <laughs> and Francois, what, what, what do you do on a working day? What do you do? Sales, marketing, mostly? Do. Yeah. So this is a circle here, or triangle, whatever. So uh, may maybe I should, like, I should say why. You know, I could say what Francois does during his yeah. day, right? Because yeah. we're in the same office. So although we're in the same office, I barely see him. He just flies around from time to time. We'll just land in the Grenoble office for a couple of hours, have a coffee maybe, debrief me on mm -hmm. who he's talked to, who he's going to talk to, and fly again. Uh, and, and every time we have an ID, we take time to actually um, you know, resonate that with Francois or try that with Francois. Yeah. And Francois, oh, I know he's going to be interested by this. <laughs> <laughs> Off he goes again. Okay. <laughs> now, I think the beauty, because we are in the same office as well, is we can exchange about a technical idea and how this could be, be interested. And so we challenge really each other, okay? And at the end, when we agree on that, mm. then we propose and then modification and so on and so on. Yeah. And we do that, the three of us. 
Yeah. And so, uh, so you, you have com completely different roles within Semtech, right? Mm. Uh, Francois, can you tell a little bit about how, um, how spread out you are actually within Semtech as a big company? Uh, and uh, why that makes you guys so effective as you are? Um, I think, um, first of all, I think the, uh, the Semtech recognize that it's better when there is an organization working well, don't modify it, okay? So, there is no, um, it's not invasive at all. We are allowed to develop, to think about it, and they are willing to take risk. So there is many things that we try really at risk, okay? So this is why I think it's effective. And we have, uh, is R&D central, so everyone is there. So this is why um, we believe. And we are not a big team in Grenoble, but it's enough to share ideas and to implement. So we have a team to develop module and so on, just to test if the idea is good or not as well. Mm. Yeah. Great. So yeah, we, are, we have this enormous chance that Semtech is still like one of those rare techno push company where actually you're, you're allowed to, to work on a few things without immediate return. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. Hey, and, and so uh, Ed, Laura is already um, ten, ten, 10 years working on it. Um, you guys sold your company. Uh, there's now Laura Alliance. Uh, the specifications are here. Their certification. Why are you guys still here? Nicola, why, why are you here? I know. Thank you, you, you don't asking. have to be so, here. No, no, that's a question I ask myself every morning, and I still don't have the answer. Um, so, no, I do have the answer. I, what really makes me go to work in the morning is the team I work with, right? So when I say the team, there are several layers of team. I have an know some team in Grenoble that we patiently assemble. So. You've gone to Grumble, you see that team, it's great. Working there is great. Uh, when I feel depressed, I go, I go to work, actually. I don't stay home, because it makes me feel better. Uh, and then there is like the, the outer team, you know, this, this uh, community here, the, the customer we interact on a day, nearly a daily basis uh, with. So it's, uh, for me, Laura is, uh, is really a, uh, yeah, a galaxy of relationship and, uh, and mostly very positive. And Francois, you no, quality think, of life? Yeah, uh, I think he's. Uh, I would like to speak about the ecosystem, but I don't know if you, um, how you feel that. But for us, the ecosystem is very important. It's just because his relationship is. Uh, we're happy to see the company successful. We exchange idea. We are not here to, to build a, a new company and to. Uh, the feeling to help the company we are successful is enough. And um, so the atmosphere we have in the Alliance, I don't know if it's all the Alliance the same, but um, it's very nice. So this is why. So we are really pleasure to work with everyone, and we are helping everyone. So there is no reason to change. Sometimes people say, because I'm a little bit older than them, a little bit, not too much. So I say, when you will go out and say, you know, I am in stage for now. Internship, yes. In internship. So in the next two to three years or whatever, I will have a real job with a real salary. So for now, <laughs> I continue the internship. Yes. Yes. No, right. Francois is right. We, we, we still learn a lot yeah. every day uh, with, with, with our colleagues, with, the, with our colleagues from the Laurelians, from the ecosystem. So that's, that's really a, yeah, an engine to... M motivating. To, yeah, motivating to go yeah. forward, to, yeah, to get up in the morning. Very good. And we still can improve. Laura, Laura One, the application. We, are we have still a lot of work to do. We're not, we're not, yeah. we're not done. Honestly, uh -huh. you've seen nothing yet. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> and so, and, and that brings me also to your the relation with the, the Semtech and the Laura Alliance. So, uh, I heard somebody saying, and I'm not going to say who, um, that says said to me, yeah, um, the Laura Alliance is the marketing department of Semtech. H how do you how do you see that? I, 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 so, honestly, there might be a part of, you know, so I'm probably not the right way to, to judge that. I can fully understand this comment, yeah. and I think there's a path of, of truth uh, in that. On a, clearly, the Low Islands helps enormously. Uh, we wouldn't, you know, this is a, uh, a fantastic way to reach, uh, to reach customers. On the other end, I think we're also one of the biggest contributors to the Alliance. Uh, historically, they, we have put, you know, collectively so much effort in that, uh, also, so I've got the feeling that you know, like this year or maybe last year, was uh, 
a tipping point where I started to see like, for the first time really, a lot more contribution from outside than from outside. So we are now okay, clearly well. a minority. We, we, we're not the major player anymore uh, in there, and that's super cool. Mm -hmm. uh, but, on, but I personally have put immense effort in the Laura Alliance. So is Olivier now, uh, so has uh, Francois. Yeah. So yeah, that yeah. Alliance has been a second job for us. Yeah. But yeah, you're in our co-chair, right? the technical yeah, committee. Uh, vice yeah. chair of the TC, yeah, for yeah. three months. That's, yeah, uh, yeah I'm, just, I'm super happy to contribute more to that work. But uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that it's not, only market, it's not only about marketing. I mean, LP1, the Internet of Things, is a competition between technologies. But it's not a competition between technologies. It's an ecosystem to ecosystem competition. So we want the ecosystem we're part of to be successful. So that's the Lower Alliance is, is, is what materializes the ecosystem you and I live in. Yeah. Good. Questions? Yes. We have two questions. Now, the mic is coming. coming. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I was still standing in the back. Yeah, you don't run fast enough. Yes. Hello. Please rise so they can see you. Pascal, I'll do it in, in English. Um, what you just talk about ecosystem. What do you see as the biggest threat to LoRa as a protocol, as a technology, and as a key part of an ecosystem in the now and in the future? We'll go uh, after that. So, I think that um, the level of expectation and the speed the market is catching up is one of the risks. Uh, the risk is that people don't wait long enough for the, market, for the market to really be huge. The market is going to be huge. There's no doubt about that. We are transforming the world. We are digitalizing the world. So it's going to happen. It just takes time. It's, it's going to take more time than we expect, more time than we wish. So we, we should just be patient and organized to be there when it's complete, yeah, when it's there. Um, my, so my version of the answer would be, uh, so I fully, uh, actually, we've talked about this so many times with Olivier, it's like, of course I agree. Um, of course then the, the, the a more baseline answer is, obviously today the direct competition is NB-IoT, but uh, in the future, I'm not so sure that Pretty much, maybe the competition is no more between like LoRaWAN and Wi-Fi than it is between LoRaWAN and, and, and NB-IoT. Um, so, uh, as things matures, I think each technology will find its, its, um, its uh, application. For the moment, a lot of people, which are not going to technical details, see a lot of overlap between NB-IoT and LoRaWAN. I don't, but actually, to realize that, you really have to go into detail of the implementation of you know, building hardware, trying to operate it, trying to keep it in the field for three years. They are, those two technologies are actually not done for the same things. One Does more that question. Does that answer your yes. question? Any other there questions? Was, there was yes, here. over there. Oh. Ah, here. Ah, you again. You're a speaker, so, yeah. Hello. So the question is, what, what is the next single big thing, big thing in LoRa? Is it the 2.4 gigahertz or something else, or it doesn't exist? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Francois. You want to answer? Francois? Francois? What's new? Yes, what's, what's I know. Up? So, I will not answer. Santa Maria. Santa <laughs> 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 Maria. <laughs> so, in fact, um, so, in fact, we are in a business team, so every time we try to work on a on a new domain where can, can be make the big change, okay? So I am working on two domains. I can only mention one. You will see the second one later on. Uh, now we are working on a, on a smart home, okay? We believe on a smart home because the first key market for us is it was um, utility, okay? Smart building is a second way, big one will happen. And the smart home, we believe as well, it's a good technology for that. So, this is a big change which we hope happening soon. Let's say soon is the uh, next one or two years. And there is over domain which is not addressed yet by LoRa because we didn't spend time on it. It's not because the LoRa is not suitable for that. We didn't spend. So now we are starting to spend time on new domain. 
but we need to see that before to talk openly. So that, that was the answer. If you're interested, you know, what are the new markets that are coming? And if your question was more like what's new in the technology uh, side of it, um, we just introduced LoRa E, so a, a new uh, uh, like addition to the physical layer to LoRa. So LoRa E is really meant. LoRa E is actually what's running on the Lacuna satellite that you can see demoing there. Uh, so that actually has been in our chip for, for you know, since the beginning, but it wasn't made public because we didn't know how to use it. So there are actually many tricks that are still hidden in our chips that we're gonna you know slowly release at, as you know we find the right use case uh, uh, for them. And uh, Olivier is busy adding more uh, every day. So we we have at least you know a fair pipeline for the yeah, couple we, of years to come. We, we do have yeah we do have a roadmap yeah. yeah. You're working in ETC on the uh, uh, device to device yeah. communication yeah. that that opens many uh, opportunities short short uh, latency uh, direct device to device uh, yeah. communication uh, on the uh, purely physical layer level uh, we've done a lot of work on ranging so estimating the distance between two devices to find find back one one back, time find your fight. stuff back mm -hmm. so that's that's uh, that's yeah, that's one of the next well, potential yeah. technologies that, that will uh, That's what I'm working on at the moment yeah. is really yeah. uh, bringing to the market the, uh, this uh, finder, you know, how do you recover, how, how do you find something, how do you measure distance to something, what are the use cases for that? So, uh, and, and with that, we actually, so it's chirps, it's still chirps, like in radars. So the ranging is really um, an active radar, yeah. like, uh, yeah, like, so like we, the military we are doing. We back it's to just radar. super cheap. Mm -hmm. And it goes through the walls. And another question over here. Well, opinions are also welcome. Please elaborate. Uh, hi, guys. Thanks for uh, the great insight. Uh, as you know, a lot of startups in the IoT just die, as uh, a lot of, as, as you know, this is uh, normal in the startup ecosystem. How did you manage from the startup to scaling up? What was the main challenges? And how did you succeed? <laughs> we solved the company. <laughs> 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 so, so, but when you know, we we actually didn't scale. Well, that's that's a good strategy. But then, <laughs> how to make a noise to get acquired? Well, perhaps that's a question for Johan. How do you go from a startup to scale up? Maybe actually that would be way better. Uh, actually, we had in the.
Hi, my name is Kirsten Jowett. I'm a proof of location specialist and I produce the podcast Lay of the Land, all about proof of location. I'm also a PhD engineering and IT student at Melbourne University. I will be your moderator for the next two hours. I'm very pleased today to be able to introduce our first group of speakers from Irnes and Smart Parks, Tim Van Dam, Luca Mustafa, and Blas Brutus. Smart Parks and Ernest will talk about their design for rhino implants and collared LoRaWAN trackers. Welcome, Tim, Luca, and Blage. Thank Hello. you. Hi. You can go ahead and share your project with us. Okay. Luca, shall I start off or? Go ahead, Tim. Go ahead. Okay, cool. Uh, let me share my screen with you. Um, okay. Um, so uh, we are from uh, Smartbox, and uh, together with Airnas, we uh, yeah we have designed some really cool and uh, yeah very good working uh, LoRa trackers for actually a very good purpose, and that is the purpose of protecting wildlife with passion and technology, as we call it. Um, I will give you a short introduction on uh, yeah, what Smart Parks is and what we are doing, and then we can dive in a bit uh, deeper into the particular sensors and applications we have. Um, so how we work in, in five steps. Um, so uh, when a protected area in Africa approaches us or we approach them, we do uh, a study on uh, yeah, the lay of the land um, we try to, to identify how we can build a LoRaWAN network. Um, we select uh, a set of sensors that can be used, ranging from vehicle sensors, rhino sensors, animal sensors, uh, ranger trackers. Um, then uh, these sensors are deployed in a network and we can gather all the information in the control room via our uh, web application. And then, um, actually, the use of the whole application starts by park management um, to actually protect the animals and to manage the park. Um, yeah, so we have a, a list of a very wide list of applications ranging from animal tracking, uh, food patrol, uh, tourist safety, road safety, uh, access control, intrusion detection, uh, movement detection. Uh, human presence monitoring, fence protection, environmental control, um, and of course all kind of uh, yeah, adjusted concepts because every park has different needs. Um, this is the, of course again, this is the the, the core team of uh, smart parks. Uh, so me myself, Lawrence de Coat, and Jeroen de Loze, <coughs> working mainly from uh, from the Netherlands. Um, this is a screenshot of our front-end application, so this clearly uh, shows um, the movement pattern of um, uh, a wisent in the Netherlands, actually also a protected area along the coastline uh, where um, yeah, these, these big European graces are, are being uh, reintroduced in, in this um, coastal area, and here you can see uh, a lot of um, yeah, lower one GPS data plotted on the map, so you can actually see what what are the yeah the home long term home ranges of this uh, of this animal. Currently, we have uh, deployments uh, all around the world, but mainly focused at uh, Africa, where the need for wildlife protection is very very uh, big. Um, and we are specialized in, in rhino tracking, uh, where we have uh, seven, 70 rhinos under our uh, tracker management, let's say, uh, which is already quite a big part of the yeah, protected uh, population, unfortunately. Um, some of our clients or people we work with, ranging from African Parks, Peace Parks Foundation, WWF, um, so really, uh, really like to work with all of them. Um, Besides from, from the LoRa one, what we also uh, uh, work on is private 4G networks, uh, mobile smart parks, um, and, and data analysis. Some of our technology partners are very, very important to us, and I, I think you can, can recognize a lot of uh, uh, known LoRa one uh, brands here. 
um, a little bit uh, deeper about how this technology supports park management and wildlife protection. Um, so by collecting uh, all kinds of different sensor information, uh, ranging from uh, yeah, biometric uh, scanners, camera observations, um, uh, but also our, our sensors attached to vehicles and animals and fences. Uh, you can also think about thermal imaging, which is uh, more and more used, acoustic fibers along the perimeters of the, of the park, but also drones are being deployed for, uh, 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 for scanning the areas. Um, and recently we've started also with, with uh, AI models and tiny machine learning uh, models, which is, I think, a very exciting uh, yeah, path to follow in the, in the next months, also with, uh, with all the uh, uh, Things Network partners. Um, then all these sensors uh, information are being analyzed, uh, most of the time even in real time. Um, then also the historic data uh, is being retrieved from, from the databases because well, these sensors generate huge, huge amount of data. And um, this results in, in threat alerts, uh, meaning the ranges are, are being dispatched to the areas where, where there are threats. This can be yeah, threats based on real-time uh, triggers, meaning uh, a, a large group of animals is, is in distress or an elephant is moving very fast towards a broken fence line, uh, yeah, prone to be uh, um, disturbing a village. Um, then, uh, well, sometimes the helicopters are going to be uh, dispatched or a ranger team that is close by. Um, some case studies, uh, which we can also discuss a bit deeper later, is our uh, Rhino Tracker, which we have developed uh, together with, uh, with IRNAS and a lot of partners uh, around it to, to get it really where it is now. Uh, a couple of years ago, we really started with with LoRa One and Rhino Conservation uh, to try and and develop a very small sensor, which you can see on the left side of the screen, um, to place that in the horn of a rhino, um, to 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 get it in there and to track the rhino for for at least two years, because in two years this grows out. Um, we needed to have this form factor because otherwise it grows out faster and you need to, every, you need to sedate the, uh, the animal every time you, you put it in. Um, so this was the form factor. Um, having, having this, um, we managed a couple of years ago to do this with geolocation in the LoRa 1 network. Um, we had a position of every, uh, every seven minutes on this, uh, on, on this rhino, but um, in some areas, it's very hard or even impossible to get a, always a tree gateway constellation to do the geolog. So we already knew then that we needed to have the holy grail, which is uh, GPS, uh, GPS positioning in combination with LoRa. But obviously, we also know that the power constraint of this device is still the same. Um, so back then, the the um, the GPS, uh, uh, yeah, the GPS chips and antennas were not good enough to do the job. Um, but recently, we have managed to to pack it all together, and now uh, we actually have uh, this tiny block which can do GPS fixes um, and send it over to over Lower One to uh, to the network, uh, giving a very accurate uh, location on the uh, on the threatened rhinos. Uh, which is uh, a world first, and I think very, very uh, good example of what the power of, of LoRa One and, and together with other uh, technologies can bring to uh, to the world. Another case study we really uh, like is uh, the elephant tracker. Um, so I think uh, over a year ago we launched the Open Color Initiative on the on the Things Conference actually in Amsterdam which is about designing and open sourcing um, an, an elephant tracker, uh, which is very often used in protected areas because um, these huge animals, usually bulls, can uh, become really uh, dangerous in terms of um, yeah, disturbing uh, behavior. That's not so much inside the park, uh, uh, that's much more, much more about uh, these big, huge elephants uh, moving out of the uh, protected area, these fenced areas, into the villages. 
if you look uh, at the map on the right side corner, you can see the perimeter of, uh, of a national park we protect in, um, in Malawi. And you can also see, if you look closely on the map, you can see that there are all villages all around the park, on the left side and on the, on the south side, on the down side. Um, so you can imagine if, uh, if, if these, these huge bulls, you can see it on the right, uh, right, top right corner, big bulls are, are marching into these villages, then they can cause quite some trouble, um, looking for food actually most of the time. So troubled uh, elephants uh, tend to be, be colored. So the rangers are, are really uh, know where they are actually, and they can stop them before they uh, break the fence um, uh, and move in. So, but the problem was these colors uh, were uh, very heavy. They were very, very expensive or are still very expensive. Uh, and this is mainly due to the fact that they always uh, uh, work on um, satellite connectivity, uh, which tends to be quite heavy um, because of the one of the antenna and two because of the uh, batteries involved because it's quite power consuming. So we, we tried to, to break all of these rules, let's say, and make it very lightweight uh, low, uh, and therefore uh, needs to be low power and uh, connected uh, to, the, to the lower one network we already have. Um, so currently, well, you actually can see the, the tracks of this, uh, of this first open collar elephant tracker deployed on an elephant in Malawi. Uh, and it generates uh, a GPS fix every 15 minutes and sends it over lower one. And it can last for um, for for eight years uh, or even more, um, which is uh, which is amazing because this means this this collar is is going to last very long, uh, certainly compared to to what they're currently using, um, and also the costs are very low. So we're trying to really put this in the uh, in the market, as we say, uh, for for uh, for around 500 euros, which is very, very cheap compared to the current trackers, which are about 3,000 euros. Um, so we really hope with this approach to, to, to get more animals safe. And as you can see on the left side, we did quite some engineering uh, together with Ernas um, and also with uh, Lacuna Space, um, because this concept really allows for, well, still allows for quite a big antenna to do um, yeah, Earth to space communication over lower one to the Lacuna network, which is uh, of course very useful when the animal moves outside your local lower one coverage, which is possible in some cases because uh, these elephants have, have huge uh, um, uh, ranges. Um, besides that, we also uh, try to really train local people. With local, we mean uh, where we do the deployment, so mainly in Africa. Um, hoping to um, yeah, establish a knowledge base where we where we can can really uh, rely on in the in the long term. Uh, also, when we uh, yeah, when we are not here anymore, uh, we hope really hope that uh, that the the locations can can pick up and maybe even start developing their own applications and sensors in the long run. Some pictures of the rhino of uh, of the elephant coloring. You can see it's a huge, huge animal. Close-up pictures of the components, the tracker. This is uh, the Things conference uh, with the actual color. Here you can see the comparison between, uh, let's say, uh, uh, a conventional elephant color and uh, a smart box color, which is. Yeah, a bit crazy. <laughs> uh, you can see very high uh, high number of updates, and this is of course the Rockstar team at Irnas working on the uh, on the Rhino tracker with the mold. I worked also together with uh, Tau Glass, uh, who actually helped us in trying to tune the GPS antenna, which is, which was, I think, the biggest uh, hurdle in the whole development of this tracker, uh, because the absence of the, the uh, well, good ground plane and the detuning of the whole, um, 
reception due to the due to the botting um, had a had a huge impact on the on the reception of the of the antenna uh, on the resonance. Um, therefore, we really tried to reach out to to also to Tau Gloves to to help us with uh, with getting this right. You can actually see that this antenna was hand hand tuned uh, by the scraping of the of the antenna. And here you can actually see the fitting of a of a sensor inside the inside the horn. And this is actually an early prototype model um, because currently they are uh, they have a, a bit stronger uh, epoxy resin. This is uh, transparent still. And that's it. Um, so, uh, Luca, do you want to take over? Yeah, so um, I can jump in. Uh, maybe in the Rhino Tracker, uh, we go in uh, for a bit more details. Uh, meanwhile, I've seen a few questions in the chat. So, uh, Tim, these are uh, for you. So, the Cat City is asking about. Uh, so, Cat City is asking uh, about. Um, how do you keep the information from the poachers? Uh, so asking if you are using TTI or something similar. Um, and Ravi is asking about um, how many gateways do you need for local coverage and how does the network uh, look in that perspective? So, um, so it really depends on the area. But for example, um, in in, uh, in Malawi, where you can see the you could see the elephant. Uh, um, uh, tracker. We are uh, we are still using um, a Semtech server uh, from the early days, and we are also using um, uh, a chirp stack. Um, and for most of our development and testing, uh, we are using the Dings network. So we are actually using a, a whole bunch of uh, LoRa servers, uh, depending on the uh, specific need. Uh, the Things Network really helps us to um, to do cross-border testing because it's always live and it always have the, has the latest features, and uh, it really helps us to make all these sensors like bulletproof. Um, and 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 Ernas also really uh, really works with, uh, with with the Things Network, so it, it it is a perfect tool for us to to work that way. Um, and with with local deployments, we really make need to make them uh, local uh, most of the times and have full uh, control. Um, and we and we yeah tend to to do that with uh, uh, with ChirpSec at the moment. Um, so the other question was about the number of gateways. I guess um, this also depends on the area. So you can imagine that some so if if a park is the size of a of a province or sometimes a small country. Um, it's also a bit about costs and, and also accessibility. So some parks are very remote, so you cannot reach to all locations. Um, and also it depends on if you really need or want geolog. So now that we not always need to have geolog anymore because we can do it with GPS, uh, we tend to deploy less gateways. Um, but for example, in the park uh, where the, where the uh, elephant tracker is active, we have uh, about 16 gateways active um, on very high locations. Sometimes we even have towers of 30 meters built, but sometimes we, we use huge mountains where we only need five meter towers. Uh, but usually uh, we use the, the Curlink IBTS uh, with with antenna diversity, so we tend to use two antennas to, to really get the maximum out of the, the gateway. Cool. So I think uh, we can jump a bit more into the uh, Rhino tracker. I hope you guys can see my shared screen. Um, yeah, we can talk a bit more about how this is built. Um, so uh, you see images, of course, of the uh, Rhino tracker here. Um, the 3D model is probably easiest to talk uh, about in this case um, because the real challenge here is making the device as densely packed as possible with all the features and the, and the smallest form factor. So uh, this is governed pretty much by the battery, uh, which is a soft uh, primary cell um, LS 14250 uh, battery in this case with two PCBs attached at the right angle um, to really minimize the size one being for GPS and one being for the 
uh, LoRa transmitter, but also this configuration particularly allows us to essentially seal all the RF components uh, between the two boards and the battery, such that when we epoxy pod the whole solution, we don't disturb, disturb essentially the RF uh, properties uh, of this. So there's been quite a lot of work just figuring out how do we make this in a small factor and make it very uh, robust. So Blush can talk a bit more uh, about the mechanics and the potting process, like how do we take that piece of electronics and make it robust. Yeah, hi. Uh, well, actually the, the main part here was to, to make it as robust as possible uh, so the, the tracker can, can withstand uh, the, the environment that it is in. Uh, so taking the electronics, make it waterproof, make it, uh, make it robust. Uh, that's why we decided to, to pot it in a, in a, a resin. Uh, so, uh, but the, the the problem here was uh, that you do not have a, a lot of space around the tracker because you still want to have uh, 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 the the uh, the smallest possible the, sm the smallest possible form factor. So uh, we uh, we put a few millimeters of of uh, resin around it uh, to. Uh, to, to ease the uh, all the applications uh, and to put it inside the rhino horn. Um, at first, we were using the uh, the clear uh, the clear resin, uh, but it wasn't strong enough, so we, we moved to uh, to uh, to some other uh, resin. Um, and I think that uh, that we have quite a uh, quite a durable product now. Perfect, Tim. So, what, what's your experience with using this in the field and testing? As you've seen a lot of different options already. Yeah. So, so um, um, yeah. So, I, I think it's uh, it, it's all about testing, testing, testing. And currently, we we are super, super happy with uh, with with the current uh, states we are in. So, I think we did. Uh, quite some iterations, uh, um, starting with uh, with with the uh, with the transparent resin. But even uh, that version, uh, there are still some active at the moment, and they are still working. So uh, they are walking. Uh, uh, let's say the rhinos are walking around, and I can I can see it uh, live on the screen. Um, and so even the early prototypes, some of them are still working. Uh, we also know that some of them failed, and I think we can talk a little bit about uh, uh, about the cost of this, uh, about uh, the battery, and I think you can explain that very well, Luca. Um, but the let's say the, the end state where we are now, the current version where we have the black resin, which is a bit more sturdy, yeah, it's it's super super dur uh, durable. Of course, we have to wait for two years until it grows out that we really know. But I'm super confident that uh, that it's working because yeah, currently there are no signs at all that it's not working. So um, yeah, I'm super uh, super happy and also uh, because we well we ship them to the local parks very remotely. Uh, and they uh, they do the deployment by uh, veterinarians without even us being there. So we we completely monitor this whole deployment remotely. We have test operations, so it's also good to talk a bit about the firmware maybe. Um, but yeah, I, I feel very confident. Um, and um, yeah, now we know the the battery issue. Let's say uh, we know how to handle them. Sure. So we can dive a bit uh, deeper into that. Um, so given this is a really small size constraint device, uh, obviously the batteries that are uh, available, uh, primary, primary lithium final chloride, um, have very limited characteristics. Uh, whereas with GPS, well, you need your 30 milliamps for the time of the uh, GPS fix. Um, so there's really no good way about getting around that. Um, and essentially we need to accept uh, that uh, the total battery capacity that's well advertised and available in normal conditions is not really available in this uh, trackers and really the whole firmware and the logic around this is built in a way where uh, devices will be asleep most of the time and uh, do a GPS fix every few hours as we configure them 
um, minimizing the power, obviously, of that uh, through uh, Almanac retention and through a local running uh, RTC. So we always try to keep as much of the hot start mode as possible uh, if the fixes are not uh, too far uh, between the two. Um, but yeah, we very well characterize this in all the conditions. So we know how it operates uh, in the lab. We know how it operates in the field and with well, the data analysis, essentially of everything we've quite fine-tuned the design uh, by now to be able to do all the features uh, remotely. Um, how GPS operates is quite interesting because we always set the precision we want from the fix. Um, so we get the minimum uh, fix time, for example, for normal applications, you can do fixed precision of like 50 or 200 meters or something like that. And if you need a more precise position, you tell the GPS that through a downlink uh, and you get that one instead of wasting power and always getting a very precise um, position. Um, at this point, uh, I think we can quickly also jump to the Lion uh, Vison Tracker and the Ranger Tracking. So this is a different design we came up with and I'll share my screen again to show a bit more of that. Um, so this is essentially an, a bigger version of about the same solution as in the Rhino Tracker, but made to last much longer, be more robust and more efficient, with also external power input. Um, and it's also a fully potted uh, solution. So, Vash, uh, I guess you can show us a bit more about how this electronic turns into a fully potted product. Um, or yeah, talk about more about why also we have a piece of PCB sticking out uh, for about well, mounting and programming and so forth. Yeah, well, uh, uh, the you can see on this screen here the the process from the base PCB to the finished product, uh, all the steps. So the first thing is just electronics, and uh, the last step is to, to put everything into the resin. Uh, the PCB that is sticking out is uh, there for the programming. Uh, so th the problem when you when you put the electronics into the resin is that you cannot access it anymore. So if you do not have any connectors or an or a PCB or anything like this st sticking out, uh, you cannot uh, upgrade the firmware, for example. So uh, that's why we we leave this uh, this part out, uh, so you can access it. Uh, but on the other side of the of the tracker, uh, this is not seen from the picture here. Are two uh, two uh, two standoffs uh, that are sticking out of the uh, of the tracker that are meant for the for the charging. So uh, th this was designed in a way to to be as easy as possible for uh, for the local guys to use. Uh, so if you want to charge it, because this one has a rechargeable battery, you just connect it to to any um, power DC power up to, I think, 30 or 40, 40 volts. Uh, so you can basically charge it anywhere from, from a car uh, battery, for example. So it was really designed in a way that it is mm, it is as easy to use as, as possible. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. And I'm very interested to know how many iterations you went through to get to this point. Uh, well, it was a combination of, of multiple projects because we uh, we were doing the, the Rhino Tracker and the, the Line Tracker. Uh, so some of the components are, are similar. So, uh, but together we have done a, a few a few iterations because even though the uh, if you start with a prototype that is already working, there are some things that you you want to change. And even when you have a final version, there's still something that you do would like to change. So uh, this process can can go on forever if if you want to. <laughs> there's always something to upgrade. Great. And uh, it seems like the price is a really good price point, especially considering that the GPS is a power hungry component, but you wanted to keep it low power for the LoRaWAN. Are you happy with where that is and, and your new plans going forward for the next iteration? Uh, Tim, will you take this one? <laughs> 
Yeah, so yeah, we're we're super happy with how it goes. So um, uh, also, this this tracker is part of the what we call Open Color project or Open Color initiative. Therefore, everything is also uh, open source available. So please check out the uh, the GitHub repositories. You can can find, let's say, the master at uh, Ernot GitHub, but you can also find the latest production version at the uh, Open Color uh, .io GitHub. Um, but we are super happy where we are now because of the fact that we are using them in the field. And I think that's the only real proof. Uh, for example, I have, I have one here. So um, they're, uh, yeah, they're, they're in the field and they're working really, really nicely. Um, and you always uh, have ideas about new features and stuff. Um, but, but yeah, currently I'm super happy and also I think uh, um yeah the, 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 there is there is nothing else that can do this in this way and be this tough uh to be honest we always look first for available sensors in the market that are there um, that can do the job and if they are not there we're going to to do r d because everything we do is is uh well non-commercial so we have to do fundraising for every single uh, uh euro or dollar we spend um so, but yeah, there's nothing like this in the market. So I'm really, really happy that we pulled it off and, and, and are at this stage where we have a tracker to use on rangers, vehicles, uh, but also put it in a different form factor where you can use it on lions, cheetah, wild dog, uh, and all uh, threatened animals. Great, congratulations. One last question we have before we wrap up. Uh, Andre Ramirez asks, what LoRa module did you use? Yeah, so we use the Murata modules uh, in all of these projects at the moment. So these are Murata ABZ uh, SD processors combined with the LoRa transceiver. Um, so this is a safe and stable design and we're uh, now slowly looking to move forward towards later transceivers and newer solutions as well. Great, great. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Good luck. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Yep. Bye. Coming up next, we have Stefan Zimmerman from Comtech. Stefan Zimmerman is the CEO of Comtech in Switzerland. There's a small but powerful development crew at Comtech. It's kind of like a startup feel in the company. They have 30 year experience background. It's embedded in the Amalthea group with over 300 employees and over 6 million group sales. Stefan is going to talk to us about how the development process for LoRaWAN hardware work is done in detail. Stefan, are you there? Hi everyone, I'm happy to uh, present you our presentation in the virtual Loa One conference. I'm really happy that we can be part of that. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce our company that you have an idea who we are and what we are doing. And then uh, I will give you an example of what we have realized uh, over the last years. And then we will give you, of course, an insight of how we do the development process of Loa One hardware. First of all, our company was founded over 30 years ago. Uh, our main focus is in developing custom-specific hard and firmware. Uh, five years ago, we had a strong focus on IoT solutions, especially on the radio products and the development of LoRaWAN products, for sure. What we have realized in the last year, so our main strength is always in realizing custom-specific solutions. Because we think a custom specific solution gives you a really big advantage in your product that you can make the best out of your application. I go through several examples we have done over the last years. One is uh, we did several uh, GPS tracking devices, and uh, that is what we are giving an insight to you later on how we realize that and what's important to looking uh, if we do custom specific how this. Next, uh, we did a lot of devices all around energy monitoring. 
We did this special device you can plug on the infrared uh, interface of power meters and it gives you easy access to that. Um, it detects what type of uh, meter you have and then transmit the values to the LoRaWAN network. That's a pretty clever and smart solution for existing power meters. We do a lot of, in the construction side, we do a lot with uh, wood construction. And the problem there is if you become a water inside the wood, the wood loses its uh, construction strength. And to detect that, if your uh, flat roof is still uh, dry, uh, we developed a lower one device for a customer for us, which detects uh, if everything is dry on the roof of that. Pretty interesting is to, uh, we see in a lot of the buildings, we have fire distinguishers and they need to be monitored because we have uh, robberies against that. So people take out of the, the fire extinguisher out of the housings. And in case of an emergency, you can't guarantee that you can uh, solve that problem uh, if you have a fire there. And for that, we uh, developed a clever device. You can plug into the fire extinguisher. We detect if somebody is removing the fire extinguisher from the wall or if you plug out the release and use it really. And uh, if one of these two things happen, you become a notification on the, the backend side that you can react on that. Another big trouble is uh, for fire hydrants. We have a lot of water uh, get out from our farmers here. So they always take out watering for the fields. And to detect if somebody's uh, removing the, the seal of the fire hydrant and watering the fields without paying for that, uh, we have a clever uh, general cap developed for the company Havle, uh, which detects if somebody's opened the fire hydrant. We like to give you now an insight uh, of our development process. First of all, it's always your idea. So you have a certain idea of a device, of an application, uh, you have a new business idea, whatever. Uh, we, we can prove that. After that, we develop with you a concept that we can think of uh, requirements for, let's say, certifications, special needs of the housing and stuff like that. We can really good support you because you have your uh, knowledge of the application and we have the knowledge of the technical point of view and how we can solve that. After that phase, uh, it comes to the most important phase, is the definition phase. So what do you really need? How long needs to be the battery lifetime? How many messages do you really have to send? You have to think about that and uh, give you uh, an idea of the size of the device because it comes from your requirements. Then it becomes the, the battery size and of course that, that gives you the size of the end device itself. And for that, it's always a compromise of being uh, the right size or as small as possible and the right battery lifetime, for example. When we have the defini this definition finished, we start into the development process. So then we really take, uh, make schematic, layout, uh, house construction, and then at the end we do some prototype uh, development which we uh, test and write the firmware for your application. When we have done that, the next phase is very important too. We have to think about industrialization phase. Sure, we start at the beginning to think about how we can produce the, the products because it's really important if you have a, a big mass production, so how you design your product that is possible to easily manufacture it at the end. So that we take in care of uh, how the layout is, how many test points we have, and of course the mounting inside the housing. That is very important uh, to take care of that to become a good product price at the end. And when we have uh, finished industrialization phase, which we build uh, uh, test facilities for serious production, uh, we made all certifications you need for sure and we have all finished of that, then at the end you have your product and we can guarantee that we can produce that product for years like it is. Because that's another big issue we see with standard products. Uh, our customers have problems to get the same product as it is even in the future. 
maybe the manufacturer changed firmware and you have trouble in the integration so you see in the field maybe it stopped working because you have a new firmware version there and all the problems you don't have if you have your own design and that is why we really recommend uh, take the risk uh, that you become really your own solution because then you have all in your hand so we decided to pick that design to show you how the development process for the Lora 1 devices work in detail. Uh, we have a separate pitch for that, which we present you with the functionality of that really uh, or extraordinary GPS tracker, because we have a lot of functionality inside here with special firmware function for uh, add-on features you don't find in the standard GPS tracker on the market. So what skills do you need for such a development process? As you here, you can see on that device, we even did a mechanical design for a custom specific housing. Uh, you need knowledge about the manufacturing process because that you can make a design, electronic design, mechanical design, which is optimized for serious production. You need really good knowledge how your production facility work, uh, how you can do the, the, the test during a mass production. Uh, you need skills and think about logistic process, uh, installation process on the customer side because we see on many standard devices you, you lose a lot of time in configuring the devices for your application and even if you scale up and uh, roll out let's say 1000, 3000, 10,000 devices uh, be really careful about that amount of time you need there for the installation process. So it's really extraordinarily important that you think about the whole life of, of that. And even in the field, so let's say if the battery lifetime becomes only to one year, you think about the time you need <coughs> to replace 10,000 times the battery for your devices. So it's really, um, yeah, it costs you really a lot of money to do that. And for that, it's maybe more important for you to save, to spend more uh, cost in a bigger battery to reach that. Great, so let's hand over the word to our CTO, Jan Ravelli. He will give you the insights about that certain product we developed in the last year. Thanks, Stefan. Hi, everyone. I'm Jan Ravelli, CTO at Comtech, and I want to explain our integral development approach based on the LPN tracker. Everything starts with your idea. In a joint discussion, the requirements are worked out and technical solutions are discussed. To refine these technical requirements, we discuss the structure and functionality on the block diagram. This is followed by the evaluation of components, such as batteries, antennas and so on. Only the right combination of a multitude of components allows a product to be trimmed for low power and best radio performance. The development of a customer specific housing has many advantages. All requirements can be considered without any compromise. Product costs are reduced and the design is unique. First sketches serve you to quickly have a feeling for the design and form language. If you like the design proposition, we start actual modeling and construction of the housing. Using rapid prototyping and CNC milling, a physical object is created so that you can hold it in your hand and carry out the first tests. If the housing prototype meets your requirements, we will start with production of injection molding tools. These molds will be used to mass produce the final housing. After the structures of the electronics have been defined in a block diagram, the actual schematic design begins. During schematic design, a refined selection of components is done and the connection between them are specified. Here we also carry out extensive modeling of the power consumption. Only in this way we can ensure that a long battery life is guaranteed for your product. The next step is the layout design. The components defined in the schematic are placed on a printed circuit board 
and electrical connections are set. All design with radio technology requires special attention. In order to achieve the best radio performance, the following topics must be considered already during the layout, like antenna placement, ratio of antenna to ground area, antenna path and so on. The finished design is produced in our own production facilities. This is where all the components are purchased, assembled and soldered. Visual inspection and extensive electrical testing guarantees the necessary quality starting with the first prototypes to the mass production. Thus, after a short time, we have a first prototype on our work desk. With these prototypes, we can finish the, the firmware development. During firmware development, your requirements are translated in firmware code. Only a sophisticated and optimized firmware architecture ensures that a device has the lowest possible power consumption. Prototypes are tested extensively here at Comtech. A series of tests are performed. Hardware test, climatic test, water tightness and drop test, EMC pre-measurements, firmware function test and of course radio test. To achieve good radio performance, we adjust the antenna and test the transmit and receive power in detail. Only in this way we can ensure that a product has the necessary quality for your application and is conform with the actual radio frequency standards. The finished device is handed over to you for your application testing. Only when you are completely satisfied with our development, we consider the development as completed and we can proceed to mass production. A new device is born. Thanks for your attention. So thank you very much Gian Novelli for your explanation about how the development process works. And as you just saw or heard, it's very important the team. So uh, you see we have uh, many interfaces between mechanic construction, your as customer, the development process in the electronic facilities and uh, the production facilities at the end, even for the sourcing and stuff like that. And there, let's say, as less interfaces you have, uh, as better and as fast you can do the development. And for that, uh, we are in a company group, so we have producers at our side and we work with a selected uh, construction side. We really know exactly uh, the, the interfaces there and that makes it very important for us. At Comtech, our team is really mixed, so we have a lot of young engineers with really clever ideas. And of course, we have uh, the half of the team is really experienced with over 30 years and, and more years experience in, in development, exact knowledge about regulatory uh, requirements, certification, and uh, the, the detailed uh, radio uh, regulations we have in the world. So, thank you very much. Uh, for your time and for seeing our pitch here. Uh, if you have any questions or even if you are interested in working with us together, we would be very happy. So just drop us an email or call us. We are really ready for you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for that great presentation, Stefan. Thank you very more much. About Comtech. Yeah. Can you talk to us a little bit about the team that you have working with you? Yeah, thank you very much, Kirsten. It's a good question because we really have uh, troubles or we become more and more troubles to find good people uh, because older people get in retirement and younger ones from the university, it's, it's hard to find. And even uh, a lot of things we need at the daily work you can't uh, learn at the, at the university because in, in the practice it's really important to uh, know things about norms, certifications, regulatory things, and that's not mm. teached at the university and we have mm. to bring them to the younger people then. 
So you have to upskill them all the time every time you get a new wave of people coming in. Yes, yeah, especially if you just uh, came from university, it, it takes some time. We think about two years. You need two years oh, right. until you are really at the stage. You can do your project by your own. Wow. But uh, they're working from, from the day one in, in projects for sure. But we have kind of a uh, godfather system. Uh, we, we can teach them and bring them up uh, the, the things they need to know. Okay. And how many people do you have working in the different areas? So actually, our team is about uh, 18 people at Comtech. And we have some people, they only do hardware. We have uh, people, they do firmware. And we have people, they do both. And we have 50% uh, of the people are, uh, let's say, younger ones. And 50% are more in the advanced sector, and that's a good combination. Because younger ones, they are, have good ideas, they bring a new spirit to it, and the older ones, they know exactly about the regulations, uh, how to design really robust uh, designs and stuff like that. And that's a really good combination for us, especially in the IoT field, where you need uh, new, new devices and uh, uh, cool combinations of that. Yeah, it's great to have that diversity, the history that some people bring to the workforce and then the fresh ideas as well. It's a really good combination. And what is your team looking forward to most this coming year? The rest of yeah. the year we have left. <laughs> Yes, so because we are designers, so we have a pretty cool project, and it's uh, hard for us to say what's coming really next. But we have some really cool GPS tracker, for example, we are working on or, or improve. Oh. Wow. And we see a lot of requirements for, uh, let's say, the, the service for facility management, especially in the lower field, uh, to optimize uh, cleaning cycles, for example, and uh, Switzerland, we always have to problem, for example, for desk occupancy, especially for the home office. So you mm -hmm. see during the, uh, from Monday and Friday, mm -hmm. you have no people in the office and uh, in, the, in the middle of the week, it's really crowded. And you try to, we try to optimize that, that everybody has his place in the office when he gets there. Yeah. And now everybody's at home for a while. Yeah. Uh, up to now, yeah, actually, yeah, absolutely sure. Yeah. So yeah. we see that in Switzerland, actually, we have trouble with the network because everybody's working from home and we, we have yeah. some, some problems there, but it works good, yeah. Generally. Can you talk to us a little bit more about the GPS? We just pretty much the last question we've got. Yes, yes. So uh, what we see in the next, uh, in the last, uh, let's say, one or two years, they're coming a lot of GPS tracker on the market, as we just heard before, for the Rhino trackers, for example. We have one for construction machine, which just uh, saw in the, in the video, and we have on the virtual wall uh, for a special uh, customer. And we are really good in kind of, if it's not a standard tracker, but just uh, GPS tracking. So we always have add-on functions, especially for one use case. So for the construction machines, we have added um, machine hour counting and we have intelligent algorithm to save battery lifetime, uh, which is optimized for a certain use case. And the one we, we do actually is, uh, is a smaller one because uh, we have uh, a lot of companies that rent out the construction machines. Mm -hmm. And let's say, especially for the smaller one, the bigger one, they're always direct because they all have uh, built-in devices already from the manufacturer. Yeah. But if you have smaller ones, uh, they have the problem. <clears throat> The position doesn't matter if the, the the tool comes back again, but if it don't come back, they have no idea where it is. And so we have kind of a function for GPS on demand so that we only uh, calculate GPS position if, for example, the device is not coming back. And right. with that algorithm, you have a really huge uh, battery lifetime on that. And that's a cool thing because you have a small device with a long battery lifetime. Yeah, that is really important. It can last a long time and it's such a small device and you can find your things again. That's great. Thank you so much, Stefan. I appreciate your time today and um, have a good evening. You too, thank you good, very day. Much. good day in Switzerland. Yes. Yeah, it just started. Yeah. <laughs> Next, we have a group called Naui. We have Asan Zabihi, who is an embedded systems engineer, and Dr. Abanab Abdelnor who's an applications engineer. They're going to talk to us about their cutting edge technology, an ultra low power EH PMIC for wireless communications protocols. Just to keep the language accessible for everyone, PMIC stands for Power Management Integrated Circuits. Now, take it away, Nally. Hello everyone, I'm Esan, an application engineer at Novi. 
Novi is a semiconductor company located in Delft, the Netherlands. We are developing PMIC solution for IT applications based on energy harvesting. Each energy harvesting system consists of four main blocks. The harvester, PMIC, storage unit, and the load. Harvesters can have different types, like solar, PEG, piezo, and RF. Our PMIC solution is not directly powering the load, but it charges up the storage unit. Storage unit, depending on the type of IoT application, can be either super cap or a battery. And at the end, the load can be an MCU or wireless communication module, like LoRa. Our PMIC has two main features, configurable MPPT and inductorless DC-DC converter. MPPT stands for Maximum Power Point Tracking. This means that our PMIC is able to maximize the power from the harvester to the storage unit. Inductorless DC-DC converter has also low BOM cost and this translates to low overall system cost. In the second part of this presentation, we are going to show you two different measurement configurations using our PMIC. And at the end, I and my colleague Avanov are here to answer all your questions. Thank you. So we have the whole uh, setup to test the Novi PMIC chip. We have the harvester, the solar uh, PV cells here. They are all connected. We have four of them here. And this multimeter shows the voltage coming out of these uh, four solar cells. They are all in parallel. The next step, the solar cells go to a Novi PMIC chip. This is the module and the chip is on this, uh, on this PCB here. And we have the current meter here, which shows the current going through to the to the battery from the PMIC, and uh, this harvester here is configurable. We can uh, remove, for instance, one of the pins here, and then uh, the voltage uh, stays the same. If you see the volt uh, meter, but the current decreases, so you can configure for different number of PVs. So as you see here, I connected the solar cell directly to the DC in and there is this multimeter here which is reading the uh, voltage of the solar cell and it's also connected to this uh, two pins here which go directly to the DC in. and the voltage here is around 1.4 volts and on the other side I uh, put the battery here and from one side is uh, directly connected to the battery and from the other side it went to the current meter and also then uh, again it went to the battery. So as you see here the current, it's the BL is advertising right now, but the current, the constant current is around 40 micro. When I cover the solar cell you see the that minimum constant current reaches to 70 micro 80 micro and when again i remove my hand this current is lower so the solar cell in this light is giving around 30 micro amps to the battery Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you very much for that video. Thank you. Nice to have you here. Hello. Thank you. Can you talk to us a little bit about what brought you to the point where you are now? Uh, okay, basically, as we explained also in the in the video, so we are developing, we've started in, in Delft developing a, a PMIC solution for energy harvesting. So basically this one, uh, we made it for ultra low power solution. The advantage is almost no external components and no inductor, as also we explained. So it makes it very suitable for variable systems, 
for IoT sensors where you want to make it as small as possible. So that makes it, and it's also it's also made for a very low power system. It can capture microwatts to maximum a few milliwatts. So that's why I'm saying it's for variable systems or for where the harvester has, is very small and uh, the range of power is around micro two milliwatts. Uh, yeah. So basically, this 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 PMIC uh, can harvest from different sources, and for instance, it can be solar. It can be a small solar cell on a smartwatch, or it can have really, for instance, in for industrial applications, there can be some TGs, so they can harvest energy from temperature differences, or any other sources that you harvest energy for around hundreds of microwatts or a few milliwatts, and. Uh, yeah, basically, this is the introduction for the whole product. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. It's kind of like a, a reminds me of a poster for Inception or something like that, the way you actually harvest things from the environment itself. You know, you, it, you don't have to put things into it to make it work, but it's yeah. sort of regenerating all the time from whatever's in its own environment. Yeah, um, true. But how, actually, how this did, is... Yeah. Go ahead. This is actually the, you know, with the... With the presence of IoT, uh, so one of the problems and challenges with IoT sensors, if you want to just implant it in different places in the environment, the problem is that either you have to change the battery or you have to wire it up somewhere that you put in the middle of nowhere the sensors. So the solution is not is not battery or is not the wiring of the sensor. The solution is just trying to harvest from the same environment and then sense the same environment and then gather the data or transmit the data, which this this data can be transmitted with wireless communication like LoRa. And uh, so that's why it makes sense to have this type of uh, EHPMICs for this IT sensors. So that's, yeah, that, but that was, that's why it makes it important. Yeah. And Dr. Abhinav? It is important yeah. to uh, harvest the energy in very efficient way. So what we provide in our chip, something called the MPPT or maximum power point tracking, which means that our uh, chip can always track the maximum power delivered by the harvester. Mm. And then it can deliver this power to the storage unit, which will be, for example, a rechargeable battery or a super cap in order to keep always compensating the consumption of the IoT device. So this is also one of the features of our chip. So that makes it less... Uh intense for for work for for needing to check on it all the time and makes it more cost effective and exactly. what other kinds of things can you um talk about that you can do yeah. so the main approach or the main vision of uh of Noe is to be like uh, plug and forget yeah like we for like uh, be always uh, capable of harvesting uh, energy in an efficient way that we don't need, as my colleague Hassan said, to change the circuit later or to, um, for example, change the battery or uh, the storage uh, unit to just plug it and forget mm -hmm. it. To Set and forget. Old. Yeah, exactly. And what are your favorite use cases at the moment? Well, most of our applications now are for uh, smart uh, wearables. So let's say, for example, uh, smart watches, uh, smart glasses. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had a prototype, I think, for a smartwatch. It has a BLE uh, module and it keeps for working and advertising, monitoring, for, for example, some uh, parameters, it has some sensors and we don't need to really change the battery of it. So it's quite cool. <laughs> yeah, that's really good. And you had a few messages you wanted to get across at this point, didn't you? Bring some ideas. You want to one, thing I want to, one thing that I want to emphasize, sometimes we receive this question from some people or customers that you're, so you do energy harvesting, then you can power up my electric car or my house or whatever. So the point is that that's also energy harvesting called renewable energy, but that's a different range of power. It's normally about watts, kilowatts, megawatts, or even further. So. What we do is just on the the other side of the power. We are around microwatt and milliwatt. So the concept is the same, 
we can harvest, you can collect the energy from environment and power up your house, but that's a different uh, industry. So this chip is made very small, millimeters by millimeters, so it's for uh, ultra low power solutions and not for renewable energy or harvesting energy from the environment. So okay. the applications, the concept is the applications are different. Yeah. Yes, so is it a size issue, really? If you got like a sort of capacity that you're working with, and then once it gets too big, like an, uh, it's uh, maybe this smaller than a bread box, but once you get to an electric bike, that's not what you're working with. You know, can you quantify that for us a little bit? Yeah, for instance, this is a small chip, five, for instance, five millimeter by five millimeter. And normally, so in electronics, you are, you uh, basically this is made for milliwatts. So if you want to go for high energy, like an e-bike or whatever, so you need bigger batteries, bigger, I don't know, MOSFETs, you need, you need to design high power systems. So that's a different field, that's a different business. So we are not in that business. We are not in high power systems. They are not going to charge up a motorcycle or something. Sometimes we get some, I don't know, from product developers or some people that maybe they are not in the field of electronics. So that's why they ask, so, okay, if you can harvest, can you harvest for for my, I don't know, electric car so I can charge it? But that's a different thing that needs big, bigger infrastructure to charge up a battery, to charge up a car than a small variable system or a small sensor. Yeah. So for side or or business and focus is more low power again, small things as, as small as possible, and then yeah, that's one of the things I wanted to emphasize. Yeah, that's good. Thank you very much. So it's basically um, something that you wear in in a medical situation, a, a doctor or some sensors in in the room, something like that. True. We got also yeah. some questions. Yeah, exactly for the medical researchers in the labs, they had some problems to connect wires to, I don't know, to implement to implement sensors in body of a mouse, and then they wanted to do some research. Uh, okay. It was painful and difficult for the mouse, so they said, oh, let's do, let's send some energy and then harvest it in the body of the mouse, and then we can do research. So they can cut the wire, it can be totally wireless. So these are also one of the uh, applications. Yeah, amazing. And do you have another uh, point that you wanted to hit there? Uh, not uh, the, yeah. If about if, this year coming ahead. Maybe. Oh, we are. This year is going to be the. We're going to have the product, the final version, also the so-called development board or the board that people can have it. If some organizations or some people, some companies are open, we are also open have to have some uh, to have partnerships to research. We can help them for their design. If they have any questions, they can contact us. They can visit our uh, website, novi-energy.com, and then we'll be happy to answer and assist. Yeah, we're open for many applications. Fantastic. That's great. Yeah. Anything else? I don't um, see any more questions there. Have you got anything else you want to say before we head out? Um, for me, it's okay. Good. Thank sure. you, gentlemen. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Next, we have Enthu. We have Malesh and Rathin from Enthu. Malesh Tagali is the founder and CEO of Farms to Fork Technologies at Cultivate. And Rathin is the technical director at Enthu Technology Solutions in India. Cultivate is a precision agriculture company, and it's part and protect offer LoRaWAN based IoT solutions to improve the agricultural domain. Let's hear from them next. Hello everyone, good morning. I welcome you all for the Things Virtual Conference 2020. Myself Ratnasamy KS from Enthu Technology Solutions India Private Limited. Today my session is about my LoRaWAN setup, precision agriculture with LoRaWAN. Along with me, Mr. Mullis, the CEO of Cultivate will also present this session. Thank you everyone to come and attend this session. Let's understand about Cultivate and Enthotech. Cultivate is a precision agriculture company who is having more than a decade years of experience in agriculture. They are providing the IoT solutions along with artificial intelligence and machine learning to increase the crop productivity with a very less water usage. 
So they are the company who is providing the IoT solutions for agriculture in India as well for the foreign markets. Now it's about Entutech. Entutech is a company who is developing the end node for cultivate and Entutech is also developing end nodes for some of the other verticals like uh, industrial automation and as well the smart water meters. And Entutech is a system integrator for LoRa Van in India. Entutech is also a technical support partner for the Things Network in India. Let's see the topics what we are going to uh, see in this presentation. So first we will talk about the current irrigation approach and the existing associated problem uh, with that and uh, cultivate solution. So these two topics will be presented by Mr. Malesh. And after that, I'll take over the session and I'll present you about the one of our uh, deployed systems setup, the complete end-to-end -end setup. I'll explain you about the end node and I'll explain you about the gateway and the LoRaWAN network server that is the Things Industries. And I will explain you about the application platform that currently we are using Ubidats as our application platform. And overall how the system is being deployed and how that particular system is working to derive the precision agriculture solutions. And what are the benefits we are deriving from this precision agriculture systems. Then we will move on to the question and answer session. Uh, thank you and I will hand over the session to Mr. Malesh now. Hi, good morning. My name is Malesh. I am the CEO and founder of a company called Cultivate. We are an India based company and we work with farmers in providing smart irrigation. We are also happy to say that we are one of the first companies in India who started working with Ento Technologies to provide smart irrigation using LoRa based technologies. It's a well known fact across the globe that on an average 40 to 50 percent of the productivity is lost due to improper watering and incorrect uh, fertigation uh, uh, practices. Most smart irrigation systems what is available in the market, they are either timer based or volume based systems. That means they don't take into consideration any last minute activities such as the temperature or the wind speed or the soil textural classes or the crop age and all these things. When a farmer decides to provide watering based on any of these existingly available systems in the market, uh, they either accept the duration of watering which could be given in minutes or hours or the total volume of watering. The key differentiation between these systems and our systems is that our system has got a soil moisture sensor. There are a lot of researches that has been conducted by various research agencies and companies to understand what exactly is the real impact of precision irrigation and precision fertigation on the crops. In the graph that you are seeing, we have taken into consideration three different crops, banana, pomegranate and grapes across four different states of India. There is a huge difference between the, the yield across states and across crops. I am moving on to the slide with the heading precision irrigation. In this there are three parts in this presentation in this particular slide which talks about what are the key differences between the flood irrigation, the drip irrigation and the precision irrigation. The point is to highlight how exactly the IoT enabled precision irrigation can make a whole lot of difference to the crops. So it's very important to understand what happens to the crop uh, when the irrigation is not regular or when incorrect irrigation is practiced. Typically during flood irrigation, since farmers don't have much of control on the availability of water or they provide the water only when it is available, they do the irrigation on an average once in every 8 days or 10 days or 12 days. And once they do that, they run the water along the canal that is in the ground and water percolates deep into the ground. Now, when it percolates deep into the ground, it actually creates the water logging. That means it's too much of water where the water stress is going to be too high because there is too much of water. On the other hand, when the water completely evaporates, the crop will once again go through the stress which is on the other end of the spectrum where there is too much of dryness. So in both places, there is too much of stress on the crop resulting in uh, lower productivity. Now, if you move on to the drip irrigation, this is definitely better than the flood irrigation. But here, since farmer is not understanding the precise requirements of a crop, farmer is giving watering based on his understanding, but of course not necessarily on 10 to 12 days of uh, uh, gap, but it's based on 3 to 4 days or 4 to 5 days of gap. In this slide, I will explain you how exactly we have gone about deploying our solution. To begin with, when you start talking with the farmers, 
we understand the crop type we understand the soil textural class which is very important to understand what is the water holding capacity we understand the sowing date of the crop we understand the gps location so that we can start monitoring and measuring what exactly is happening with reference to other parameters that our sensors are not able to sensors are not able to give the irrigation is going to be very crop specific that means when we are providing irrigation even if the crop is same but if the soils are different or if the agro climatic zones are different invariably the irrigation is going to be different and if you take the same crop but sown in different time frame see which is spread across 15 days apart then the irrigation is going to be different having an sensor driven iot system will enable us to understand all these things take corrective action or provide precise watering based on the last minute data that we collect from these things and how did we go about deploying this lora solution this is what i am going to be explaining in the next uh, slide once we collect the basic data the rest of the activities in terms of the precise watering should happen based on the age of the crop the temperature of the particular day right and what was the wind speed what was the evapotranspiration there are various factors that should be taken into consideration to ensure that the crops are being given precise amount of watering no more no less and the other thing that we need to consider is the the irrigation is going to be very very crop specific thank you malesh for your detailed explanation about the cultivate solutions and how the cultivate iot systems are helping farmer to increase the productivity and also reduce the uh, water usage okay so let's see the how actually the lora van setup uh, is being deployed in our uh, precision agriculture solutions what actually the cultivate is offering in our lora van setup uh, there are two types of end devices one is called field controller and other one is the pump controller i'll talk in detail about these two nodes in the upcoming slides and here we are using the lora van outdoor gateway uh, from atsalink let's see what uh, what the field controller is capable of so the field controller is connected with the three important components one is the soil moisture and other one is the solenoid valve and other one is the flow sensor so our system is in general actually it is measuring the soil moisture and the, based on the soil moisture data the pump control the pump will be turned on via the pump controller loravan end node from the application platform so once pump is turned on then also the solenoid valve will be turned on for the particular plots and the solenoid valve is turned on then the flow sensor will start measure how much water is actually flowing with that particular uh, flowing to the particular plots so once this uh, water is reached the threshold capacity then based on the soil moisture data our application server will send a downlink to turn off the pump as well to turn off the solenoid valve so basically we are measuring the soil moisture and based on the soil moisture data we are watering to the crops only uh, for the necessary uh, amount of water then we are stopping the water so this is the overall flow and also this lora van end node is working with a 3.6 volt battery and also equipped with the solar panel for the uh, for the continuous operation and also this is an ip66 waterproof enclosure where it is actually deployed in a field and it is it is consuming very less power uh, like 0.05 milliamps while sleeping and operational uh, it is consuming around 135 milliamps so it is it is also a yeah, low it's working in a lora van class a so and also we are working on lora van class e models for our next upcoming deployments as i have mentioned already the pump controller is another lora van in node we are using in our uh, deployments so pump the main objective of the pump controller is to control the pumps which is available in the field uh, based on the downlink commands from the application platform so this pump controller is capable of controlling the single phase and as well three phase pumps for this deployment we are using the gateway from atsalink so the gateway model is ug87 this gateway is an eight channel gateway with uh, multiple backhaul connectivity options so it supports for 4g and it supports for the uh, lan and as well it supports for the power on ethernet so this gateway is one of the effective gateway for our uh, most of our deployments 
So we are also the technical and the commercial partner for Arsalink in India. So being a system integrator, we are recommending Cultivate to use this particular gateway and we are also seeing uh, the better results with this gateway. For this deployment, we are using Things Industries as our uh, LoRaWAN network server. So currently we are using the, the TTI version 2 and also we are uh, exploring the options for TTI version 3. So once TTI version 3 is come up in commercial version, then we will migrate the, all our Cultivate applications to TTI v3. So currently uh, you could see the screenshot where actually we have registered the devices uh, for this particular deployment and uh, some of the devices are already sending data. Uh, that also I have put it as a, a screen capture here. So being a, a TTN uh, user for a long time and we are seeing that Things Industries is offering the uh, one of the best solution uh, for integrating the LoRa WAN uh, systems in a very quick time. And also it is having some of the interfaces uh, where we could able to integrate our application platform in a uh, quick time. For example, currently we have used UbiDots as our application platform and we have very uh, direct in, uh, interfaces for UbiDots and we could able to just create an API key and integrate the UbiDots and the network uh, server. As I have mentioned already, so our system is working on based on the soil moisture sensor value. So based on soil moisture sensor, the application platform triggers the uh, pump and triggers the solenoid valve. Once water uh, reaches the threshold level, that means the soil moisture is reaching the threshold level, then automatically the application platform sends the doubling to turn off the solenoid valve and as well the pumps. So if you see, this is our IoT dashboard where we are uh, displaying the uh, soil moisture level and also we are displaying the battery and we are giving the all useful informations which is very much important for the customer perspective. These are the important benefits of the Cultivate Precision Agriculture Systems. So one is the it is reducing the water consumption to up to 20% and also it is increasing the crop productivity up to 20%. So these values are derived from some of our proven systems and deployed uh, solutions. We have derived this data and thank you everyone for attending this session. And you do do visit Cultivate website or Enthutech website to get clarity on our systems. And also you can uh, ask if you have any questions now. Thank you. Hi, Routine. Thank you very much for that presentation. Hello, Kirsten. Thank you. Thanks for organizing this great conference. It's great to be connected with you. Can you tell us a little bit more? Just expand on your current projects for us a little bit, if you could, please. Yeah. So, Entutech is uh, working along with Cultivate to deliver some of the uh, solutions for uh, precision agriculture uh, projects. So we do work with, uh, for example, the products like the soil moisture measurement and multi-level soil moisture measurement. And also Cultivate is currently concentrating on some of the various uh, crops like pomegranate, paddy. So there are a lot of crops which we are doing the ground analysis and we are deriving the precision agriculture solution for that. And you're doing that from the, you're, you're, com you're building the components, putting them together and delivering to the customer. Absolutely, yes. And so your, your main focus is agriculture. Is that at all times or do you reach into other areas as well? Okay, so Enthutech is working along with Cultivate for agricultural solutions. And Enthutech as a company, we are also working with uh, solutions for industrial automation and uh, solutions for uh, smart water metering. So Enthutech is owning a brand called Aqua Drops. So it's a uh, dedicated brand for the smart water meter solution, uh, which is available from Enthutech. So we are working for uh, the uh, domestic uh, water metering projects. Okay, so you can supply that to, to anyone yes. in the domestic market. Yes, yes. And how long have you been going as a company, as a business? Uh, so uh, basically we are registered from 2015. So it's almost five years now. Okay, yep. And over that period, what sort of challenges have you met and been able to overcome in the building of the process of these new products that you're making? 
Uh, the, the thing is, the technology is not matured enough. So even mm. we know that uh, the Lora van is getting matured in the market, uh, uh, like India. So it's a developing country. So we are seeing a lot of challenges to uh, uh, approach customer uh, to explain about the solutions and the benefits. What they are going to get. because the traditionally they are using the gsm kind of technologies but uh, i think uh, we have a lot of challenges with respect to uh, convincing customer to go for this some new technology but i believe we are overcoming it in a better way yeah that's tricky you've got sort of two challenges there one working with this new technology so you're educating and training yourselves all the time finding out what it can do and people are coming up with new products that you can use all the time but at the same time you're trying to educate your customers so how how big a team do you have to work on the education process okay so in general entutech is a 25 members company so in that uh, for a dedicated for sales and marketing we have around 6 people uh, and apart from that we have the sales channel partner across india so we have around, we have partnered with almost 8 companies who is who are actually who are all selling our products and solutions across india so you could consider uh, at any given day uh, at least one or two places in the tech team will be there to convince customers that's great that you've got someone else to do that sales and marketing for you while you design and build the products itself themselves uh yeah so uh, we are working in uh, two aspects so the one is like uh, we are also distributing some of the uh, the great oem manufacturer oem uh, products like dragino and arsalink in india Mm-hmm. and as well we are building the customized product for the customers for example if some requirements are very specific and customer needs the customized products and we are supporting them on the product development and apart from that if the optional products are uh, readily suitable for their use cases then we are going ahead with that okay gosh well there's a lot of support so you you do a lot of customer support is that right yeah absolutely so how big so we are yeah, yeah. so for customer support we have around four people so who is dedicatedly working for the customer support uh, alone for lora van so uh, basically we are also the uh, verified partner for things network in india so we are also a system integrator so uh, basically our team is having skill set from end node up to application layer so we are uh, doing best in this segment as of now Wow, that's great. And do you have to go out into to, to the farms where your solutions are being implemented or is it just sort of a pack and send and then talk to them on the phone? How does that work? Absolutely, the field visit is very much important. So before our uh, customer is going and deploying the products in field, so generally as a technical and network planning team, we will visit the field and we will analyze what are the uh, best possible way to deploy the network. And we do the field commissioning as well. Then only we will uh, go and deploy the products. So. Uh, i believe uh, since we are deploying the network and we are deploying the nodes in very remote areas so we used to get a lot of challenges like the mobile network issues and the backhaul connectivity problem so there are a lot of steps which we need to uh, estimate uh, before we deploy the solution so field visit is very much important so it's it's a water solutions water management that you have soil management yeah absolutely and what what's coming up for the rest of the year for you what 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 projects are you going to be launching that you're excited about yeah so uh, currently we are working on uh, two exciting products so one is the generic node uh, what actually uh, for example till now we have done around uh, 70 proof of concept for uh, various customers so we are thinking and we are uh, we have derived a common product requirement uh, which could be useful for any customer to start with their pos in a very quick time so that is one of the product what we have in our radar and the second product is we are thinking to uh, release the uh, pulse counter for water meter it's a kind of retrofit solution for water metering and energy metering so uh, these two are the important segment as of now for us yeah you're getting a um, pretty big catalog there of products yeah. for the agriculture sector that's Absolutely. fantastic yes Are there any yeah. yeah and it's great that you're with TTN you know supporting that whole community expansion there as well yeah absolutely so uh, we are we are uh, we propose uh, things industries as an enterprise uh, stack to our customers who is going commercially and who is going uh, the proof of concept level and we are supporting them with the uh, things network 
so we are uh, supporting them with the out of the box demo so whoever the customer wants to deploy their proof of concept so our team supports and integrate from end node up to application platform and we are giving them the out of the box proof of concept so it is uh, uh, reducing customers deployment time and customers development time and once customer is uh, completing the proof of concept successfully then we are uh, proposing them and uh, the things industries uh, the enterprise stack and uh, we are proposing them the better sla uh, stuffs Okay, so it's a full service uh, offer. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Are there any more thoughts you want to leave us with? We're going to have to wrap it up there. Uh, yeah, thoughts? Kirsten, thank you. Yeah, the Things Network uh, is doing a wonderful job. So uh, um, it's it's a lot of participants and a lot of knowledge sharing and a lot of, lot of stuff to learn. So thank you, Things Industries, and uh, thanks the whole team and as well the moderators like you. And uh, we wish to have these kind of sessions very frequently. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Pleasure. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Next thank you, Kristen. Yeah. Next yeah, up, we're going to talk to Johan and Vinka and get a big wrap up on how the whole conference went. This amazing 24 hours online virtual conference. We're going to hear how it went for them and some final thoughts and what to look forward to in the future. Stay with us. Absolutely, Kristen. Welcome, Johan Stoking and Vinka Giesemann. How are you feeling after this 24-hour marathon? Yes, very good. Thanks. Thanks. We're, we're almost there. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Feeling yeah. great. Good, good. Well, good morning to you, because I hope you got a, a few hours of sleep last night. Probably not much. But uh, it's the end of the day here in Australia, so I'm just about to wrap it up. Um, you know, I was thinking about this whole conference and it reminded me of a quote by William Ford Gibson, uh, who's an American-Canadian cyberpunk writer, 
Back in 1993, he said, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. And I think the virtual things conference has come a really long way, especially in these past 24 hours to more evenly distribute the future to everyone. What are some of the standouts that you think that this platform has contributed to more evenly distributing the future to the world? Shall I start uh, on? Yeah. Or, uh, no, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know it's a very nice quote, and I think it's uh, it's very well aligned with um, with uh, with our vision is that we're trying to lower the barrier of entry for the technology, and then automatically create broader inclusion and make sure that more uh, people can get their hands on the technology, and that also brings a way more diverse and um, a, a diverse adoption. Um, so, and the highlights for the, the conference was that <clears throat> mostly that the the, um, uh, the content was really hands-on. So it was really about output, uh, creating uh, creating something, showing how to create it, um, people telling about how and showing how hard it is. No like fancy uh, predictions mm. or fancy mm. fancy stories. So um, so yeah, I think uh, I think that was that, that was that was my take on on the last 24 hours. Yeah, I think um, uh, the, there's the, the, yeah, the, what, what we all have in common in the Things Network community is, uh, is, is, is technology. And, um, but it's really nice to see how much people in the community want to share their knowledge and um, how, how happy they are to, uh, to contribute and to um, make sessions and to tell about their technology and to share it with others uh, so that they can apply it in their own, in their own ways. Uh, that's that's great. Uh, I think Lawrence can also tell more about um, how many contributions we got for uh, for content. I think we could fill uh, easily forty eight hours of uh, wow. presentations uh, for uh, yeah with more people sharing even more content. So that's yeah that's huge. So we've kind of I mean, we are we are just a platform, right? right? I mean, Vink and I are, are only facilitating this, uh, and uh, it's it's not much that we do here. This is really community driven. That's amazing. You know, um, that kind of makes me think about how we are in this, you know, you guys have really focused on what exists, what's possible now, um, show us what's really working. And that's the thing that's really attractive about the Things Network is it's you can implement it now. It's happening. It's working. But it also requires a kind of imagination at the same time to imagine what might be possible with these things that we're doing. Do you think we've struck the balance in this last 24 hours between the two, the, the imagination of what's possible? Think about what we can do, inspire others, yet we'll show you what we can really do right now. Yeah, I definitely I, I think so. Um, so it's indeed imagination. It's looking into the future, possi you know, future possibilities. And um, uh, I personally have a lot of uh, focus on technology and, like you said, on, on what is possible today. Uh, but it's really nice to see people working on use cases, uh, you know, for for the community um, that uh, that make things possible that were not possible before. Uh, so protecting wildlife uh, or you know any you know societal impact use cases that we see on TTN. That's super super nice. Uh, but it's also even on a technology level, uh, it is it's it's fascinating to to see, for example, that we broke the. Um, the balloon uh, transmission record again, uh, 775 kilometers. Uh, that's that's amazing. That's uh, you know the technology is is there, and um, uh, yeah, that's that's really good. And for me, uh, so I as uh, operating the network, um, we see uh, 10,000 gateways plus connected, 11,000, and uh, for, for for me, that's sometimes just a number. Uh, but when you see the balloon going up and you see all the gateways that are receiving that in Europe, um, that makes me really realize how much uh, blood, sweat and tears goes in installing those gateways. Uh, and people actually own them and they, they follow the traffic and uh, you can look up all the gateways and then there's a gateway on a ski resort in uh, Grenoble that picks up the message uh, that's actually installed by somebody. Uh, yeah, it's really nice. Yeah, you talk about community. That seems to be the main. Sorry, are we going to jump in there, Vinka? 
No, I, I just wanted to respond to what you said is that is this technology push and then like a more value business value pool. And uh, one of uh, the main contributors and, uh, and uh, of this conference was Irnas, a Slovenian uh, systems integrator, and they, they nailed it so perfectly. So they, they always are like at the forefront of technology, like like trying to push the latest and greatest. But um, these guys always manage to 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 make sure that that what they do actually makes a lot of sense. And, and yeah, I think they are, these guys are super inspiring to what they do. Um, and their sessions are always super cool back here because I think that like when we had our first conference in 2018, they they already had a device that was able to uh, track underwater turtles. Um, and um, for for science, and and now of course they have a lot of com uh, customers in the maritime industry. So so yeah, I think I think what you're saying it's a it's a it's a balance or it's a, like a back and forth between uh, value push and uh, value pull and technology push. Uh, but uh, but yeah, that is that is definitely. I think we we would be proud if that's something that really would be the output and uh, the 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 subject that uh, that our speakers. Uh, 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 half year, yeah. Yeah, because they want to build those trackers on the turtle now. What do we have now that we can deploy on them? But we want them to last longer than the turtle, which is a long yeah. time. So yeah, it's yeah. hard to, to, to get that combination right in a scientist's or engineer's mind. Yeah. And you mentioned this is about community. You know, what? where can we track that balloon? It's going over all these different places. And TTN is really based on community. It's pretty much the core of who you are, would you say? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, and that, that's also what we see uh, in, in these in these conferences, uh, and, and especially a virtual conference where there's way more interaction between uh, the speakers and the participants and the participants among among each other on the on the chat. Um, but yeah, it's it's a truly community uh, initiative. Like I said, we we only facilitate it, so the rest is it's everything is community. Is what you envisioned, are we where you envision now? Are we ahead of schedule? Are we behind schedule with the community and the expansion? Where would you put us now? And, and what reasons would you say for that? Yeah, yeah. So so I think um, uh, uh, I think that there's not really a head or not a head. It's like it's the dri community or the ecosystem is the driving force. So they determine. We just, as Johan said, facilitate and give the platform and and basically with everything uh, we do, and um, so so there's not really a uh, a, a a like like uh, it's not a race, right? So it's yeah. uh, so so that is uh, so. But I think uh, then another question: if you would ask you and me five years ago that the things that would look like this. And we would not have expected this. That's that's for sure. So, uh, so it, yeah, it's really cool how it how it evolves. Uh, yeah, bigger than you thought it would be. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. And what do you see on the horizon for the Things Network um, as holding the most potential for growth? Where do you think you're going to see that growth coming forward soon? Um, now, so going back to your first comment, so uh, the future is here, but it's not evenly dispersed. Um, <clears throat> the, um, I think what you see in, uh, because we have all these communities around the world, they all are in a, a, their own uh, maturity uh, uh, phase. So, um, for instance, if you see in the Netherlands, with there's a lot of gateways and, 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 and you see a lot of activity and you see also a lot of enterprise activity on the public network and there's like so so and then you see a lot of companies moving towards also our enterprise proposition but you see also in other countries where they're just exploring the technology and the the the, the interesting thing is is that where where some countries are more ahead of the technology or places where they they can pull the rest with them right like how technology evolves and so um um uh, so yeah that's that's a bit what to see cool thanks Lawrence. do you want to jump in there on any of those thoughts yeah like uh, i think there are some some nice things that have been said already is is where where we kind of see now how everything fits together how the whole community uh community like joins in together 
and uh, I think we like we had thousands of people that, that joined in for the like the past 24 hours, and that's really nice to see. And uh, indeed, like we like we only did a bit of facilitating. We have a few minor sessions that we hosted ourselves, and and by far most is from the from the community itself. And um, yeah, like I'm really inspired actually by all the things that I've seen. So I I had the chance to watch most of it during the 24 hours. So uh, um, I think it's really really nice to see. So just uh, just to be, be clear, uh, uh, Lawrence is in our, in our headquarters. This is not his living room, but and he's been awake for 24 hours. So uh, so, so yeah. Big round of applause. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the tech like, team too. Small eyes I, uh, I might still have. So um, but um, <laughs> yeah, like it's it's been really cool actually. And uh, and uh, if I may. Like I've been, I've seen really cool, very nice things from uh, like a home workout by Johan and uh, yeah. and Jan with like an uh, edge computing device on their arm in sheep outfit to like the balloon that I don't know in total the message was picked up by 1800 gateways within a couple of hours. I think it's really amazing. Um, I've been I've been really amazed by a few very good presentations. Um, Ivan Holt, he uh, he's like a developer that did a complete full run through about the whole development process of an end-to-end -end device uh, way better than I think we could explain it ourselves. Um, uh, I learned tons of things about antenna tuning. It was a bit of a difficult subject, but uh, at least it really like gives, a, gives, an, gives some insight into like this development process. And, um, and and actually just now before this uh, this session I uh, I, I uh, was listening along with uh, with lacuna space and uh, they even did a live demo um, of like a message sent to a satellite uh, forwarded to the packet broker um, going back to the like the, the normal console so uh, it's, it's really cool how that everything uh, fits together what about you guys? Do you have any standout presentations that you learned something that you were surprised about? Or did you sort of know it before we went in? <laughs> mm, yeah. Um, whoa. I, I think that. a lot of the, uh, a lot of content is, um, uh, what, I'm, what I'm mostly surprised about is, is, is indeed the quality of the content and, and seeing it all together. Uh, so I, I get to see, you know, quite some lore when, technical content uh, during a year, uh, but seeing it uh, concentrated and contributed by our very own community using our own products, that's really cool. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm mostly amazed by that. Um, and uh, and also the, uh, that, you know, we, we can pull this, this off even just in three months after our face-to-face uh, -face conference in Amsterdam. So, so many things happened in only a few months. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, same here. I think I think first of all, it's, it's really nice that uh, people uh, in the ecosystem share their knowledge because you can also say that is like, for instance, their core competence, which they built their business on. So, um, so that's that's super cool. And I, I think I was watching the live stream of the balloon, and there was like hundred people watching. Yeah. The screen. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I was watching it myself as well. I think the whole team was watching it. And it's just sure super fine. cool. It's like building up tension is like, I don't know, like you could make a TV show out of it or something. Okay. But um, uh, so maybe it's, it's, it's even a bit therape therapeutic or something. But so, so, so that was, uh, that was really cool. And we've got like, uh, like 24 hour long, there was constant, uh, constantly uh, people watching. Right, so it's yeah. like, it really shows that it's it's uh, it's uh, it's it's uh, it's, uh, it's all around the world, and um, so that um, that was uh, was really nice. And I think my last point would be uh, there there was quite a diverse diverse uh, diverse content, so a lot of different angles. And uh, the the reason why IoT is hard is because uh, the the scope of competences is very big and very broad, and you need to know a, a lot of things about a lot of uh, small bits in the technology stack and um, uh, so yeah you need to know a bit of everything if you want to put it all together and and I think that that got yeah we we, we touched uh, uh, and the, uh, the speakers touch everything there so yeah, that that was nice yeah you have to be a little bit of an expert in everything and then put it all together and if you're not be that's able right. to source the right people and I think that's something that the things network is really good at it is 
providing those people. So there's now this massive network that these people could get in touch with as well. Yeah, for sure, yeah. And we've got a lot of really nice shout outs on the chat channel. So thank you everybody for okay. that. I hope you guys can see that. And um, we might take this moment to thank the um, tech teams as well for all their work in the last 24 hours. Yeah, for sure. You guys want to say anything about the people behind the scenes? Yeah, no, of course. As the, the, as somebody's uh, putting some extra fire in the thing. Behind that's really the good. scenes, that's my team. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that tech team as well. No, um, yeah, I think, um, uh, I mean, everything went, went super smooth. And that is that is like during 24 hours. So um, and um, uh, and uh, yeah, Lawrence just uh, pulled a well uh, all night here That's and uh, made it all together. And, and uh, yeah, it's a combination of, of uh, yeah, of uh, of. Uh, of like making we have all the right content from all the contributors from the ecosystem and uh, too many to to name but we're going to redistribute all the content and make sure everybody gets all the credits and uh, Lawrence and uh, and the tech team and um uh, and that's that's super awesome yeah yeah and i and i think to add here so uh like also thanks to all the all the moderators and the speakers because like we kind of had this crazy idea i think three weeks ago so we had two weeks to think about it ourselves and then only like two weeks before the conference we started inviting speakers so actually all the content that you've seen today um has all been created in the past two weeks so we actually put a lot of pressure on all the partners who first had to find speakers create powerpoint slides i don't know get get the latest updates and uh, and i'm really impressed with every what everyone came up with in just two weeks so yeah. big shout out also to all those speakers and, and workshop hosts the caliber was outstanding of all the presenters and the moderators and i'll take the opportunity to thank you all for the opportunity for having me here as well it's a lot of fun and i am passionate about everything in this space and what is working now and what we can do. So thank you very much for letting me participate. I've got two big questions to round up the session for you. The first one is what can we look forward to in the new technology in the next year? Like what technology is coming up that we could get excited about or we should follow the research for? Yeah, so I can answer that. Um, so what we are uh, the big thing. So what we've seen also in the um, uh, in the in in most of the presentations was uh, our new uh, commercial solution, the things uh, enterprise stack, which is our V3, uh, but that is not available yet on a community network. Um, so I think a lot of community members are eager to get started with with our new um, software stack. So what we're going to do is to this year is migrate our community network uh, to V3. Uh, so that everyone can can use that. Uh, on the commercial side, we're going to make our cloud-hosted uh, offering available with the service level agreement, so that our cu customers can also rely on uh, on our operations. And um, yeah, I think what we see also, you know, there's a lot of uh, um, increasing professional use of LoRaWAN, and um, uh, that that grows rapidly. And we don't want to go. We don't want to um, uh, let let it go at the expense of the community network. So, for example, when we have community members that set up uh, gateways for business cases, uh, and then they migrate to our cloud-hosted commercial solution because they need a service level agreement, uh, then traditionally they would take off those gateways from the community network and connect them to their private network. And so this is really where Packet Broker comes in. It's not only a solution to exchange traffic between the community networks, but also for um, our customers to contribute back to the community network. And that's what we see a lot of demand for uh, in, in, our, in, our, in our customers or private customers to, um, uh, to contribute to the community network. And we have uh, almost twice as many gateways uh, connected. Uh, um, uh, our, our customers have those connected than the TTN community network. So, yeah, th those are the really the big technical things for the next year is to interconnect um, the the entire ecosystem. Fantastic. Do you have anything to add to that, Vinka? Uh, no, 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 nothing, nothing. This is uh, this is the, the, uh, exactly what what Johan said. Uh, also, um, after the conference, this, this, that story resonated very well with uh, with the broader ecosystem and. Um, um, and um, no, nothing to add there. 
What about the coming coming up in the future for the conferences, for the community? What have we got to look forward to as far as when's the next one of these? Are we going to do a 48 hour one like everyone's begging you to do now? And, you know, um, what do you, have you thought? Have you thought? Is that too far ahead for you? You just get, get home. Yeah, I think uh, with with the current situation, we cannot even uh, predict what uh, how the world looks like in uh, seven days. So um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I think uh, we should not make predictions for further than that seven days. Uh, uh, with if you talk about the physical world, right around uh, events. And, uh, uh, but um, we can, I think after the last 24 hours, say one thing for sure is that this format works. Yeah. And, and this format is it. So, and, and I think what, uh, what Lawrence uh, can be super proud of is that um, it's not just putting a conference online. It's like building a new type of knowledge sharing experience. It's not just like, okay, let's do what we did, but then, online because that that usually doesn't work because you have so you have you, it's so different so uh so so i think we can say that and um how we're gonna go on with the physical conference around the world um yeah that is a that is a big question mark but um i think we can uh can be very positive that we have a very very good alternative yeah this format works definitely and the workshops were interesting too did you guys get a chance to jump in there at all yeah, yeah, I was switching screens all the time. So uh, I had uh, three screens open at some point, the main stage, the, the workshop, and the following the balloon. <laughs> well, yeah. So uh, yeah, it's, it was really nice to see. Yeah, yeah, a lot of live live workshops, um, uh, also some pre-recorded, it's uh, completely fine. Uh, you know, you don't want to mess up when so many people are watching. Um, but it's, yeah, it's super interesting to see uh, technology being yeah. used live, yeah. Uh, so, and there's one format we didn't really try to push today but we're going to put that uh, in the coming months is a uh, is a, a, a virtual um uh, uh wall of fame so having uh, devices that are already connected and that you can control from remote and that for instance you can watch with the webcam and then you can control door opening closing and then you can play around with that without having it on your workbench with that would make the whole device um let's say exploration experience extremely interesting virtual and it also will tie in with uh with some uh some uh, some some very interesting new technology we have coming up for device makers in the in the in the next half year so yeah so we, we will be thinking about new new experiences and new ways how to experience technology uh on and on and on yeah. so this isn't the end it's just the beginning of the expansion and the new kind of virtual things network uh, every day is day zero right so yeah <laughs> every day every minute yeah. so we've just got a few minutes left any any last thoughts you want to wrap up lauren's with this behind you now really well and truly would you so, do it again uh, living on the last few hours only on, on coffee so um, um <laughs> I, uh, no but uh, i think it was a very cool experience uh, i've learned a lot of things uh, indeed like what binka mentioned is uh, is we gonna like somehow like we, we we stick to this format in some kind of way in the future so uh, there there's more that everyone will hear from us um later this year and uh, yeah, I'm very happy with all the results. So again, also big shout out to uh, to all the um, all the, the, the people that listened along. And it actually was very funny. So um, we saw some people basically in Europe at some point. People were kind of going to bed or they were checking out, and then you saw like a new stream of people from the US tuning in. <laughs> and actually, there was a bit of an overlap there, so that was super funny. And I even found like a, a few people that I knew were from Europe that were still online in US hours. Uh, so uh, also a big shout out to the ones mm -hmm. who at least gave it a try to stay online for the, the, the full 24 hours. So uh, it was lots of fun to see. Super. Yep. Right. Everything in the in the in the channel is just thanks and thank you TTN. Thank you for awesome conference. It was a great conference and very useful. I think people found it useful and helpful. So um, it was a great wrap up, guys. Great, thank you. Thanks for for wrapping this up. And uh, yeah, Lawrence can go to bed now. <laughs> <laughs> good job, Lawrence. Oh, nice. Hi, Thanks good job, guys.
Thank you. Okay. Thanks to all the viewers. Bye. Yeah, thanks to all the viewers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah.